Okay, uh, it's getting to 9.32 uh, in the morning UK time. I'm sure the times are different for, for lots of our uh, delegates uh, around the globe. So welcome to the first International Active City webinar. We're just going to have a brief introduction to the day and the session. Uh, so I'm going to pass directly over to Jean-Francois Laurent from Tafisa to say a few words. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Thank you very much, Keith. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Tafisa Board of Directors to the first International Active City Conference hosted by the Liverpool John Moores University in partnership with Tafisa and Evaleo. To start with, I would like to congratulate especially the Liverpool John Moores University, which is celebrating this year its 200th anniversary. And we are having and they are hosting this conference today in partnership with all of us to celebrate this anniversary, which marks certainly a milestone in the history of the university, but also in the UK. I would like to welcome and thank all of our speakers who are joining today. We have an action packed program and I would already like to highlight those who are with us this morning, including Dr. Fiona Bull from WHO, Klaus Meinel, Secretary General of, uh, of IAKS. We have with us Isabella Burksack from UCI, Fozzi Ekran Moritz from the uh, Innovations Manufacture in Germany, Mary Curry from Sport Islands, and many others. I'm, I'm only highlighting a few. Thank you very much for joining us today. Today's theme is very topical since the world, as we all know, has been experiencing quite a number of challenges in the last years, and uh, especially the COVID-19 pandemic has impacting the well-being of citizens worldwide. According to a UNESCO Fit for Life study, the pandemic led to a drop of 41% of physical activity participation worldwide and a 200% increase in mental health conditions in youth cohorts. At Tafisa, our goal is to create a better world through sport for all and to get as many people active every day. To do this, we strongly believe that cities, municipalities, or local government areas, whatever you call them, especially have a key role to play. Cities are the places where people live. Cities are the, are the places where people spend the most of their time. We will probably learn today that the world is urbanizing at a skyrocketing rate. And uh, cities are places, once again, where people spend the most of their time. So today we will learn about how to people in the different settings of a city, be it schools, be it open and public spaces, be it the workplace. We will also learn from case studies at local level, at national level, and we will explore how to build an active city, as well as discover tools, practical resources that can help you, that can help any city or country to develop this active city approach. I once again would like to thank all of you for joining us today and I very much look forward to learning a lot and I wish you a great conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean Francois. If I can invite Alistair Dalrymple from Valio to say a few words as well. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, and good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good day to uh, all of you. Uh, my name is Alistair Dalrymple and I'm Secretary General of Evalio, which is a Swiss-based NGO uh, uh, specialized in sustainable health and well-being. Uh, to start off with, I'd very, mu very much like to thank uh, Professor Keith George and all the team from Liverpool John Moores University for hosting this event. Uh, congratulations on reaching 200. Not all of you, obviously, but at the university, uh, congratulations and hope that the next 200 uh, will be very fruitful and uh, academically satisfying. Uh, to follow on from what Jean-Francois said, um, uh, as I said, we are uh, involved in sustainable health and well-being, and uh, there are many factors which contribute to health and well-being of individuals, of society in general. Uh, why are we particularly interested in sport and physical activity? Is because it appears to be one of the fast track routes 
to creating sustainable impact. Nutrition, environment, and many, many other factors contribute, of course, to health and well being of individuals and of society in general. But physical activity and sport, and uh, in short, movement, is one of the fast tracks to creating a quick impact. And uh, we, along with our partners, such as Tefisa, Liverpool John Moore University, and many others, we are uh, putting forward a whole series of programs, participating uh, across the world to enhance sustainable health and well-being, notably through physical activity and sport. So, Jean-Francois has outlined the, the main programme, and uh, I look forward very much to hearing what everybody else is going to contribute on that very important theme. Back to you, Keith. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Alistair, um, and thank you to both of, uh, both of you for, for suggesting that I'm 200 years old. It probably looks like it, but um, the university was set up in... Uh, in 1823 as a Liverpool Mechanics Institute uh, and the family tree from there leads to, to Liverpool John, John Moores University and it was it was set up uh, for the benefit of the um, of the people of Liverpool in a, in a time where Liverpool was urbanizing hugely uh, and growing hugely and facing significant health and well-being issues so there's a bit of resonance across the uh, across the years uh, through to the point where obviously John Moores University now has a has a vibrant uh, physical activity uh, exchange group that have been working with the Liverpool City Council, been working with Tafisa, Avalio, uh, IOC and, and, and many others, especially in the, uh, the, the active city agenda. So we're looking forward to, to seeing how uh, the day pans out, looking forward to the, the presentations and questions. And again, our thanks to everybody who've given up their time to speak to us. Um, and, and also to, to listen to the presentations. Uh, I'm going to, to, to move very quickly onwards, and that is to say that we'll get going in a second. Um, if you want to introduce yourself on the, on the chat function, say who you are, where you're from, that would be great. If you could keep the questions to the Q&A, we have Zoe uh, who's going to look over the Q&A and we will ask questions at the end of each session. So there'll be a two or three presentations in each session, and then we'll get some questions uh, at the end of those. We've got a break for lunch, uh, where obviously people uh, can go and uh, get fed, watered and, uh, and recover. And then at the end of the day, for those people who want to have a little bit more direct engagement outside of the, the remit of the sessions, we've got an hour where the panel um, from the three institutions will, will hang around and take questions probably more of a, a personal nature or a specific city nature and look at uh, support options. Uh, and we'll also circulate some, some links and some emails in the, in the post event uh, communications as well. So not wishing to take, uh, take up any time, uh, we've got a tight schedule. So I know session chairs will be making sure everybody tries to, to finish and run through on time. It, it's my great pleasure and honour to introduce our first guest speaker, the highlight of the day for many people, uh, Fiona Ball uh, from the WHO, head of the physical activity unit there and well known to everybody I'm sure on the screen. Um, and Fiona, I'm going to go straight to you and ask you to share your screen if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, a very good morning to everyone. And uh, and thank you very much to Tafisa and the hosts at Liverpool John Moores and uh, a very um, great pleasure to join this session. This is a great opportunity to start the year with you all with a reflection of where we've been, where we are and the challenges that we have in addressing something that's core to all of us. And that is the problem of physical inactivity, but let's turn it to the positive and that is promoting the enjoyment and health benefits of being more active through all the ways that we can, sport, walking, cycling, um, and through our daily lives. I'm going to start uh, at the very beginning here uh, by giving you some take home messages. And uh, in case I run out of time, but also to sharpen our focus, 
we have a great challenge. I think everyone knows those health benefits. I'm not going through those details. Everyone knows the levels of physical inactivity. Everyone knows we can do more. So what is it we have to do? And I've got five take home messages and they call for action in five areas. And I think cities have got a great opportunity to build on what they're doing, but also to show and lead in many countries these areas. Number one, we need stronger ownership across government, not just leadership, but ownership, commitment and delivery of the bit that they can do, whether it's ministries of sports, departments of sport or transport or health or education or local governments. And they are all at the city level and, of course, up to the national level. But we must strengthen the government's leadership, ownership and uh, responsibility to deliver. Number two. We've got to help implement, because I'll show you that we know what to do, but we're not doing enough of it. And we have to think about that at the city level. How do we help our colleagues work better and implement? And working better is number three, better together. Partnerships across the sectors, involving the communities, and cities are very good at that, and strengthening the workforce are going to be critical to achieving number two, the implementation. This won't happen unless we've got good data, data to show us what we're doing well and what we're not doing, data to guide us, data to inform and plan forward, and monitoring to show whether we're achieving those goals and targets, as well as sharing more of our own data, more of our knowledge, more of our practice of what works. And lastly, and obviously, all of this needs better funding, stronger funding, possibly more funding, but certainly funding aligned with the policy commitments, not at empty rhetoric, but funding aligned to what we want to achieve. If it's more walking, let's put financing into the walking infrastructure and uh, the programs that will support walking. And we could play that out for each of the areas. As I say, I think cities are an incredible catalyst and a driver for implementing and uh, on physical activity and showing leadership in these areas. Now with those five take homes, I'm gonna step back now and just share with you some reflections of the progress we have made. And this slide is showing you the progress across the global landscape of policies helping and supporting and setting the stage for national and city action on physical activity. On the far left, I'm sure everyone on this call is aware of the Global Action Plan launched in 2018. This is where I said we know what to do, built on evidence, evidence from universities, researchers around the world showing what works. We set targets in 2018, so we know where we want to go. In 2020 and 2019, we updated to ensure everyone was aware and can access the science on what types of physical activity, how much and what counts. And we know every move counts, being active in all sorts of ways across all ages at all abilities has mental and, and physical health benefits. So we have a very strong platform. We know what to do. We know where we're going. And we've got the science underpinning uh, those, particularly those health benefits. We've also started at the global level to help countries and guide an ongoing process of developing some of those tools that I mentioned, the guidance, how do we do it? And I think this is one of the challenges, which was number two on my earlier slide. We need to strengthen communicating the core components and how we implement and sharing that knowledge. You see the front covers of some of the tools available, and there's more forthcoming this year. And as the introduction showed, we have a challenge because COVID has disrupted the way we live, how we can be active through those years, particularly 2020, 2021, were very impacted by the impact of the policies of COVID. And we're still recovering and re uh, rebuilding from COVID. We produced an advocacy tool stating the importance of physical activity. It was produced in a collaborative way with many inputs across sectors and globally. And it's available on our website. In fact, all of these tools are available on the website, but you can see by the name of it, fair play. We have to address the inequalities in physical activity. 
and catch up with the impact of COVID. I'm delighted to say that the end of 2022 was a landmark as two new items were produced by physical, uh, the unit of physical activity at WHO. And I'm sure some of you were able to join us, but if not, I take a few moments to introduce these and guide you to where you can get more information. The first of these was a global stock take. How are we doing since the launch of the Global Action Plan? Where are we now? And how will we improve to get to 2030 goals that I just introduced? And my five take homes to you are clear messages about more needs to be done. We also launched a new price tag, an advocacy uh, economic tool, because it now prices the impact of us not changing and increasing levels of physical activity. I want to take you through a little bit more on this latter piece because I'm sure you're interested. So this new price tag is a complicated and large piece of work which culminates with the take home message that in the next decade through to 2030, we are going to estimate to see 500 million new cases, preventable cases of NCDs and mental health conditions. They're listed at the bottom of the slide. The cost of those new cases, which would be preventable, is 300 billion US dollars in total, or around $27 billion a year. Now, this isn't the full amount we could save because we have to invest in delivering physical activity, but it gives us a price tag and puts on the table the magnitude of the importance of addressing physical activity. We hope to continue this work and show it in different ways, specific for each of the diseases, and of course, look at the net costs when you look at the interventions required. It's these kinds of numbers that can change the dialogue, change the conversation at city levels and at national levels. Just looking at those, because I know some of you will be particularly interested in what were the diseases, and you can see them on the um, uh, x-axis, and you can see the impact of hypertension, and depression. These are the preventable cases by more physical activity. And we can see the costs, which also are large for hypertension, depression, and dementia. It is not just in high income countries. This slide shows as you look across the X axis, different regions on the left set of bars. It's across all regions, notably in West Pacific, Southeast Asia, less so in Africa. And it's across all levels of income, but I'm sure you can see the high um, uh, incidence in the uh, low and middle income countries. So the message here is that we must work together globally and put our extra effort in supporting middle and in income countries and particularly cities, large mega cities in these regions. My last slide on those data, which will give you a resource to uh, get more on, is showing you the cost and that distribution. And of course, the high healthcare costs mean that high income countries will take a large burden of that um, 300 billion price tag. But of course, it's going to affect the lower and middle income countries as well. Lots of data, lots of information, lots of potential for advocacy. The main message there, a tool for the conversation to get to why we need to mobilize that investment in physical activity. Let's go back and have a look at the uh, stock take, the global status report. This took the approach of assessing how well are we doing in implementing the global action plan recommendations, which many of you know are built on four pillars and boldly color coded as shown in this slide. You also are aware that it's not just taking one or other of these, but in fact, the global action plan calls for at a city level and at national level, a systems approach, whereby the systems and those gray lines linking all of the recommended policy actions work together in synergy and multiply the impact. So when we're doing education and promotion in the top right, as shown, 
It will work and be supported by creating the environments that provide the regulations to ensure access to sporting facilities, public open space, cycle networks, and the programs that are underway in sport for all, workplaces, schools and primary health care and across cities are supported by and linked with the public education and the environmental supports. But we also know that they drive the behaviour change, but must be enabled by the governance system shown in blue on the top right. We need those policies to say it's important. We need the data to drive and, 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 uh, and monitor. We need the research to uh, provide new tools and new approaches and evaluate current approaches. And we need partnerships. And I think it's quite well accepted now. It's not cherry picking one or two of these, but at city level and at national level, building this systems approach. And there are many examples through the active cities and elsewhere where this systems approach is beginning. And we need to share those stories. However, when we did our stock take, asking all countries at the national level, whether they are achieving the recommendations, there were 29 indicators available, and this slide summarises that only two policy indicators were achieved by 75% of countries. The majority were not achieved by over half, you can see this in the bottom, 18 of those policy indicators, less than half of countries are making progress on them. And in between, we have nine policies where around half to two thirds. In other words, we have really a cup half full or half empty uh, a, a situation here in 2023, halfway towards our 2030 target of increasing physical activity by 15 percent. The main message of the report is that progress was slow, i.e. not enough, but also uneven. And I'll just give an illustration and uh, introduce you to the report structure. Most of the data are available to you in the format shown by region and then by economic um, income classification using World Bank on the right hand side. The data are also available for every country in a set of country profiles. So if you're interested in your country, you can download your single country's report card. But this, guard, this particular example of the data show you the results on having a national physical activity policy, one of those governance tools that I mentioned. And we can see overall the global estimates shows that 40 percent. It also shows a decline because data where available for trend are shown. So in 2017, before COVID, we were doing a little bit better. But since COVID in 2021, the last data collection, we can see a small decline. The unevenness is shown by that differential uh, reporting across the regions, less in West Pacific, more in the Americas, most in Europe and least in Africa. We must level up this and support the countries uh, through cities and countries national efforts to get the fundamentals, policies on physical activity and then push to have the policies implemented. I think there's no surprises in the right hand side of this graph that there is a gradient there of progress on physical activity, reflecting economic resources and capacity, high income countries with more and low income countries with less progress. This is a pattern repeated, whether you look at promotion in general practice, um, evidence of walking and cycling infrastructure and many other areas. One of the other gaps is actually data is missing. And I highlight for discussion in your day to day that we weren't able to capture progress by cities in any particular way. So we call for city level action in the global action plan, but we haven't yet got a way where we could capture city level progress. And I invite you to discuss and think of ways and work with WHO over the coming years to see how we can address that showcasing what cities are doing, but reporting overall the progress. So one, let me, one finish. Minute, Fiona. Let me finish by yeah. just reminding you and putting now in context those first five minutes in my last minute. I called for ownership, 
And you can see across that systems approach, <laughs> it requires collective ownership. We're not asking any one government sector, any one sector of the community to change physical activity. We're calling on each part of the system to contribute and deliver collectively. The implementation guidance, I think, is fundamental because it needs to be simplified based on evidence, practical, feasible and adaptable to cities and countries. The partnerships which we're here today as part of this workshop building still need to be strengthened and we need to invest in the workforce. And I've already mentioned the use of data and I hope you'll turn to and use the data shared to advocate and drive your work. And then lastly, it is about shifting the funding because there's too little directed to deliver the implementation that this paper and the report called for at the end of 22. I'm actually optimistic for 23 because I think building on this advocacy and these data sets us up now for stronger arguments, stronger partnerships and a focus on delivery. So I draw your attention to where you can get a whole suite of materials and I'll be able to share this slide deck with the uh, colleagues for you. It's in video, executive summary, pro country profiles and technical reports. And I share uh, finally uh, the link to our website for any more details and contact with us. Once again, thank you to the organisers. And I hope that's food for thought for your day of this Active Cities. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Fiona. That was uh, really very useful and a fantastic setup for the for the day from from you and uh, and the World Health Organization data. Uh, just to note, we'll keep questions um, uh, for the end of the session. So I'll pass immediately on to Gaetan Garcia from Tafisa, who's going to give the second presentation of this particular session. And please, people uh, around the uh, screens, feel free to put your questions in the Q and A and enter anything in the chat. Gaetan. Thank you for this opportunity. Good morning, everyone. Hello again, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And thank you as well to Dr. Fiona Bull for just uh, providing a brilliant presentation that will also allow me to go faster on my presentation because now I do not have to remind as much about the importance of physical activity as it was highlighted so well earlier. So our goal and objective is really to use Port for All as a tool uh, to tackle our global challenges. And one of them being indeed the national uh, um, non-communicable diseases, which is on the rise and which we know physical activity uh, participation can be a great tool to combat. Now, this is why we are looking at active cities because we believe active cities can be a way uh, to solve this issue. But first, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is a city? It's actually a quite difficult and tricky question because there is no clear definition about what a city is. And we are trying to find out how to approach it. Cities have been evolving over time and there are different definitions depending on what you're looking at, depending on the density, depending on the level of urbanization, depending on a lot of different factors. And while there is no clear definition, you can consult there's a very excellent uh, paper from UN Habitat that's actually trying to tackle this issue of what is a city and explaining their perspective and approach to it and defining a concept, a functional concept. Our idea is really to take into consideration any urban center, any community, any group of people that are living in a shared space that uh, can act at their level to turn their environment into a more active environment. So when we're asking ourselves, what is a city? Evidently, we are thinking about all uh, the cities, the big cities, uh, cities of a certain number of inhabitants, several thousand or tens of thousands, but it really relates to any uh, group of people living in a shared space where we can act, where they can take action to turn their everyday environment into a more active environment. So we are trying to take the largest possible definition all encompassing that uh, brings uh, the most people uh, towards living in active city. Now, urbanization is indeed uh, a big trend uh, where we see that in 1950, only 30% of the world's population was living in urban centers. Uh, by 2050, we estimate it's going to rise up to 68%, maybe even higher. And this means that from a population of a couple hundred millions worldwide who used to live in cities, 
we are going to reach uh, several billions. So this means that cities is really one place where we can affect and touch a lot of people, a lot of the active population. And this is why we really believe in the power, the transformative power of cities to really bring about change. Now to bring about change, we have some policy framework, which allows us to understand a bit better what active cities can bring to the table. Uh, the WHO Global Action Plan on Physical Activity and its four pillars have just been introduced. So there's no need to go over this again, but I really encourage all of you to consult it. It's a brilliant resource that uh, brings a lot of uh, very valuable insights on how we can act and what needs to be done. We have the TAFISA mission 2030 and with 12 themes uh, across which we identify how Sport for All can contribute to the sustainable development goals. And there is one chapter on active cities that highlights uh, more specifically the role and the connection between Sport for All, active cities and how this can be of great benefit to the people. And there is at the European level also the EU Healthy Lifestyle for All framework which is based on the uh, article for uh, active living, uh, for healthy um, action. And basically this healthy lifestyle for all is about a pledge, a framework to make sure that uh, more people can be active, can be healthy. And I also uh, encourage all of you to consult this. But the point is that there are resources, there are political resources out there that introduce the importance of physical activity, that introduce how this can connect to active cities. And this is a vital component of starting with active cities to reach out to decision makers and policy makers. Our bodies are designed to move, our cities should be too. This comes from the design to move uh, framework and uh, specifically design to move active cities. And this is an important statement. It shows how we have to maybe rethink how cities are designed, how they are built because right now we are seeing uh, with urbanization, with the number of cities rising from the 1950s and with the way our lifestyles have been affected in active cities, but also embedded in how cities were built and designed. A lot of cities have been built in ways uh, to make life maybe more comfortable, uh, easier, but also based on how I would say um, we were society used to function. And a lot of it, we see in many cities that cities are built around cars, for instance, or around roads. And uh, this does not always leave a lot of space uh, for act physical activity. Beyond that, this means that the design of cities has to be more intentional. We have to rethink a little bit how we perceive the space we evolve in and how we can make it fit so that we not only try to get people to become physically active, but rather we bring physical activity to the people by embedding physical activity as part of the daily lifestyle of people. So what is an active city? Finally, an active city prioritizes physical activity in all of the places people work, learn, live, travel, and play. However, few people realize and recognize the role they can play in changing and improving the citizens' lives through sport for and physical activity. That's why we really advocate the development of active cities worldwide and we'll identify what opportunities there are. Cities represent a host of great opportunities to make physical activity part of the daily life of people. First and foremost, they have the infrastructure. Cities are where people live, they are people where, where people commute, they are where people go uh, to work, where people meet, etc. And there are a lot of infrastructures uh, that cities have, not only sports facilities, but also open and public spaces, schools, and other uh, public spaces and community places where people can meet and be more physically active. Cities have the tools necessary for the solutions to our problems. They also have the power through governance uh, of multiple stakeholders to make some changes and to build these changes inside uh, into the city life. So through city policy, we can enhance access to sport for and physical activity. We can, for instance, uh, design the city better for uh, to privilege uh, active transport options uh, for people who are commuting, for instance, whether they are going to school, to university, or to work, or other places. If you make it friendlier uh, to be for people to bike or to walk, then you will also increase uh, sport for and physical activity. You can think better in terms of planning, in terms of urban design 
to access uh, non-traditional spaces and places uh, that we can turn into areas for sportful and physical activity. We can, of course, think about new developments, developing new areas, developing new infrastructures, but this is always seen as something a bit costly and people always have a bit of reluctance towards this because they think it's going to cost a lot of money, but actually there are a lot of ways we can also refurbish existing areas, maybe refurbish old infrastructures and change the way uh, they are to redesign them to make it friendlier, to make it safer, more accessible, more inclusive, and simply places where people and communities like to gather and where they can be physically active. So this shows some examples of what can happen in the daily city life that can be thought about to transform habits into healthy and active habits. I will not go too much into detail about how we can design active cities because this will be tackled during the course of this webinar and you will learn into more depth what steps, what quick wins can be implemented to turn a city into an active city. But there are several ways. So one of the mindset is to really prioritize physical activity as a solution to several problems. See how physical activity and sport for all can contribute to building a better world and can contribute through an active city mindset to really changing the lives of people for the better. We have to think about unlocking existing resources to make them active resources. And this is a little bit the way we can try to steer away from thinking about costly solutions or thinking about brand new developments and infrastructures. We can already look at what is readily available and start from there uh, to implement quick wins that are almost immediate and that already bring about a change. We have to think about designing things and life for people to be active. This is quite simple in principle, but once again, it shows the importance of being intentional about the way we go uh, on design. And finally, we have to build a legacy of movement. We have to create changes that will live beyond uh, the life expectancy that will really make a lasting impact on the life of people and on the way the city lives. There are five success areas that we have identified for active cities. Knowledge and awareness refers to the fact that uh, policymakers, decision makers, community leaders, but all stakeholders have to be aware of the importance of physical activity, the benefits of uh, cities becoming active cities, and what they can do and how they can influence this change. Breaking silos, very, very important cooperation and partnership. There are a lot of different stakeholders at the city level, from the governance and administration of the city to uh, the health sector, the education sector, uh, the police, the fire department, a lot of big different organizations as well, community leaders who are acting. All of these people, all of these organizations, stakeholders need to be convened, need to be brought around the same table because they will transform the city together. And the citizens are not uh, excluded from this conversation. It's always very important to get close to the citizens to identify what their needs are, why they are going to a certain public space, why they are not going to another public space. For instance, you can have a great public area which would be suitable for physical activity and uh, for whatever reason is not so uh, frequented. So you ask the citizens and citizens might come up and say, okay, well, it's maybe a nice area, but I don't feel very safe there. Uh, especially because at night it gets quite early. So it means maybe we try to find ways to improve lighting. Other people will say, yeah, actually it would be great if there were more benches so that when I go there, because I'm quite old, I want to be able to rest and that would be a friendlier place. Or maybe we try to also organize some uh, activities. And this goes into the next step, the programs and events. You can make spaces more attractive by organizing programs and events in these spaces, in these public spaces. And of course, programs and events are great ways to bring people to an area, but they also have sometimes a short duration. Sometimes a program or an event is a one-off thing. So it's also about thinking how we can design them so that they leave a lasting legacy again, so that they really have an impact that is lasting, so that when people are used to coming to a public space because there was an event regularly, then they can think about doing something themselves, organizing their own events privately, maybe or in smaller groups, so that uh, the community keeps on appropriating these spaces for the public uh, life. 
spaces and places very important. And there is also what uh, the urban sociologist Ray Ollenberg called the third place. This is really the public space where people gather, where the community really lives, breathes, where they exchange, where they communicate. This is really what the social fabric of the city is. And all of these spaces and places uh, can be uh, also modified and designed so that they are friendly to physical activity. So we have to also think of that, how we can make these spaces and places friendly, welcoming, accessible, and designed uh, to make physical activity and sport for all uh, easy as possible. We want to remove all the barriers that prevent people from being physically active. And last, of course, as with all strategies, as with all changes that you want to implement, monitoring, evaluation, and continuous improvement are important. And this step I want to highlight because we have to understand that turning a city into an active city is not a process where you have a start date, an end date, and that's it. A city is an active city, it's over now. A city is a place that is constantly evolving, either adapting to the needs of its community, always living along with the life of the people, of the citizens who are there, with the people coming and going, with people's lifestyles changing over time because they are aging, because they have different priorities, because the trends in the world are changing as well. So a city, an active city is a constantly evolving model, which always has to adapt to the new needs, to the community. And uh, this, is, uh, this is something that is alive. Uh, it's not something that we build and then we can just live away. It is alive and we have to constantly monitor, evaluate and assess how we can continually and constantly improve it to keep the active cities as active and attractive to the citizens who are living in. Last, last minute, uh, last minute Gaetan. Yes, I am finishing with this. So there are many benefits for active cities and that's very important, uh, highlighted in some of the policy documents that I've uh, mentioned earlier. There's a lot of resources as well uh, online on the benefits of active cities and other speakers today will go more into detail about them. But uh, economic benefits, uh, of course, because active city, more attractive cities uh, will uh, generate more income uh, for businesses, for shops, there will be more activity, etc. Safety, very important. If you have active cities, you have more people living and entering the public spaces. Uh, we have to, it also uh, ensures more, uh, less crime. We have data on that. And also if an active if a city is designed to be um, uh, better for active transportation, you also have lower rates of pedestrian or cyclist injuries. Environmental, uh, of course, because active transportation means also less car use. So reduce emissions, more people uh, preferring uh, to be active and physically active rather than taking the car, for instance. Improved air quality. Health, uh, because of physical activity and its impact on uh, non-communicable diseases, but also because through social inclusion, through uh, enhancing social health in general, people are healthier and happier and social that uh, intertwines with health, uh, better cities, active cities, creates more community, more sense of belonging, more sense of also owning the place you live in. That is it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any further questions, uh, please don't hesitate to use the chat, the Q&A function, or to even write uh, to us at Tafiza. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gaetan. Um, Again, I would uh, would ask uh, uh, delegates on the webinar to send their questions through on the Q and A. A couple of things have, have come through uh, other media. So, uh, Gate on a couple of qu questions from from my perspective in terms of the the sort of active city issue. I know that uh, Tafisa and, and and colleagues have worked with um, multiple different cities of of different sizes and different locations and different challenges. I wonder if there, there's something that you take from, um, from those differences that, that is a constant uh, in terms of how Tafisa can work with cities or how cities can work with, with each other. Are there, are there really key issues to, to get in place independent of what the type of setting it is? I think one of the, the key aspects for us is really this idea of building an alliance really bringing all the different actors and stakeholders uh, around the same table to discuss and to find out how, based on their experience, based on the knowledge of the community they are living in and evolving in, but also the community that they are fueling through their activity, 
uh, how they can really turn their city into an active city. And I believe that the first problem sometimes is simply bringing the idea out on the table. People don't always know the concept of active city or understand it, understand its relevance and how this ties in sometimes to their objectives and goals. So it's really getting these people to be aware of the issue of aware of the potential as well uh, and the transformative potential they have uh, through their work to turn a city into an active city and how this can really make a lasting change in their community, in their city. The, um, the, the, one of the things that I think that was picked up uh, nicely in your presentation was, was um, space and, and, and design. And, and I'm just wondering how common it is to have cities where urban planning is informed by uh, issues like uh, physical inactivity. You know, we're, we're aware of buildings having to be environmentally friendly and net zero and, and all of those sorts of things. But, but how common is that within the urban planning that they get the, the physical activity and activity issues? I do not have data on that, unfortunately. I would think that this is a part of the conversation that the, I would say the sport for movement, the sport for world that us uh, specifically have to get more into because when you read about urban design, about uh, urban planning and designing new spaces, modern spaces for the modern life, you see a lot indeed, as you say, about sustainability. You see a lot about community life, creating spaces that are friendlier, more welcoming, and that are really engaging uh, people uh, to be happier, to live a happier life inside of the place where they are. You are you have more focused on the sense of belonging that people have to their places, but physical activity is sometimes a byproduct of it. When we are saying, okay, we are trying, for instance, to go for more active transportation, that's because it's also tying in uh, to uh, sustainable uh, questions. So I believe that there needs to be more work for raising awareness on how the issue of physical activity and sport for all is really relevant in this sense and how uh, we can really make it part of the conversation. It is already, but it's more, I would say, as a byproduct or by default, because we are saying, okay, we want a space for the community. Maybe the community wants to play football together because that's a big thing where they live. So we create a space for that but it's not really necessarily uh, the end goal, at least as far as I've seen so far. Okay, we have a, a question in the, in the Q&A, Gaison, and I think this is probably an easy one to answer. And, and it's sort of about the definitions of what physical activity and sport for all encompass. And it's about, um, you know, considering active clubs, uh, you know, sports clubs. Um, and I think, you know, fundamentally, I, I, th I think that's just part of the equation. It's absolutely in there in terms of being an active city. You, you would agree? 100%, yes. It's, it's really about understanding that every actor and stakeholder that has an impact, uh, however small, on the community that it evolves in can contribute towards an active city. So an active sports club indeed can definitely do something by not just welcoming people in the club and doing its uh, exclusive club activities, but also seeing how uh, the club can have, uh, can take a more important life in the life of the community by going maybe outside of organizing trial sessions, trying to move uh, outside of the sports facilities and infrastructures uh, towards maybe a square in the city to allow people to be physically active. There are many ways uh, to do this, but absolutely 100% an active club can be uh, part of an active city. I mean, in, in, ma in many countries and certainly in Europe, many countries in Europe, the sports club is actually part of the community, part of the cu cultural fabric. And it's um, probably very well embedded as a, as a place for d delivery of, of health well-being uh, initiatives. Others may be less so, but I think that that is a really good way to, uh, to, to get people engaged. Um, we have a, a final one uh, from Katrina and then we'll, we'll move on to the second session. Are you starting to see major sport event host cities integrating an active city approach, ideally certified certification into their bid strategy and legacy plans? 
Yes, this has been our experience uh, in the recent years, and uh, we are seeing it more and more, uh, even with the organization of, my, of uh, really big sports events, uh, such as the Olympic Games or uh, big uh, sporting events. There is an impact, and there is an increased focus on the idea of legacy, of really leaving something for the local community, the local citizens to have something remaining after the event, once the party is over, what's left, what's remaining. And uh, we are seeing that there is indeed a trend to, to build and even embed this legacy as part of the project of hosting a major sport event. I'm not sure we are 100% there yet. I think there's still quite a lot of work to be done there, but at least the conversation is moving in the right direction. And uh, this is now on the agenda. And I believe this is already a very big first step uh, towards better um, physical activity and sport for all minded uh, projects and events. I mean, I, I would I would add um, that we've obviously worked with Lily Hammer post their Winter Olympics, and I know we've worked with Lausanne post the hosting of the um, of the uh, of their um, young young Olympics uh, games, and and I think other other cities may even be on the call now who are doing that. <clears throat> very very quick one, just in terms of a response to Edna, who's asked about active cities initiatives in Africa. And I think Tafisa and all partners would say that that's a really important target for us. We've done some work, especially in the Southern African Union around Botswana. Um, but Edna, if you wanted to, to make contact with us after the session, we'd be, we'd be happy to share uh, current activity and working. So Gaetan, let me say thank you very much for, for your, uh, your, your time. And if people have questions moving on please post them and if they've got questions for for fiona i'm sure we can get back in touch um uh, right now i'd like to pass on to professor limbody who's going to chair the uh, the next session as we we move from the the theory into the practice thank you lynn and thank you speakers thanks keith thank you everybody this morning um good morning everybody as we're tight for time, I'm going to get straight into the presentation. So I'd like to welcome our first uh, presenter, Klaus Menai uh, from IAKS, who's going to talk to us about active spaces and active design. Okay, Klaus, uh, if you'd like to share your screen. Yes, thank you, Lynn. And first of thank all, you. thank you to uh, John Moore University, to Eva Leo and to Chafisa for inviting IAKS and myself to this, uh, to this webinar today. Yeah, um, my, my topic is um, active spaces and active design and mobilizing public and open spaces. So um, before well, I get into the topic, I would like to uh, introduce a little bit what we are doing at IKS. And um, IKS is the International Association for Sports and Leisure Facilities. Um, we are, um, we have been founded uh, in 1965 in Cologne. Does the screen sharing work? Sorry, could, could you please tell me if, if the sharing works? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, we have been founded in 1965 in Cologne, and we are the global non-profit organization for professionals from the sports, leisure, and recreation facilities industry. So we are kind of we're kind of at the interface between sport and and uh, architecture and construction. Uh, we have about 900 members worldwide, and we are a kind of networking place for architects, landscape architects, engineers, for operators like uh, local authorities, technical management, sports federations and clubs, and also for suppliers and manufacturers of sports facility products. Our mission is facilitating an active world, and we have uh, corporations with the IOC, with IPC, FAFISA, ICSPA, and many other international bodies. Um, well, we have already seen this chart, so I'm talking about the second pillar today about creating active environments and the WHO has identified a couple of um, well topics that uh, should be addressed when you talk about active environments, um, such as um, highly connected neighborhoods, walking and cycling infrastructure, safe environment, good quality public spaces, recreation spaces, or um, as a subline, spaces that enable everybody to be active in and around public buildings. Now, um, what is a mobilizing space? And I will 
I will try to offer you some learnings later on. But first of all, I would like to, to ask the question, what is a mobilizing space? Um, for me, it's, it's a feel good place, first of all. It's a place for socializing and a place for the people. Um, it should be a leisure facility for families. It should facilitate lifelong healthy lifestyles. And it has to be a place for gentle activity because we have these inactivity problems. So we need offerings for gentle activities, but certainly also offerings for challenges at different levels because challenges makes users to uh, want to come back. Um, active spaces need to be accessible to all age and ability groups, and they should be located within a 15 to 20 minute walking distance from your home. Such places should offer good visibility. They should be safe and protecting and perhaps offering shade and protection from bad weather. Um, it would be very good if they can offer water as an element of play and of life, but also just tap water to drink. Um, if they can be used and converted for different functions, it would be great. And, and this is very important um, that the, the design should be appealing and innovative and it should stimulate your curiosity and your playfulness. I'm now um, going to show you some international examples or some stories, how that looks like, how that could look like. And I hope that brings you some inspiration for your future work. So um, the first example is this one here. It's a place in southeastern Brazil. It, this is a town with more than 1 million inhabitants. And what you see in the picture is a former bus station and car parking ground. It was converted into a bus station with an activity zone. So car parking uh, converted to activity zone. Um, this place now includes elements for all ages with a focus on young people, such as children's playground, water splash area, skating area, table tennis, open air theater, areas to rest and to relax. The model topography stimulates running and climbing and this is a very important its location in the very middle of a dense neighborhood makes this place a very important element of the urban life over there. The second example is uh, looking at the very young um, people, at children. This is a kindergarten in Beijing. And what is interesting here, the kindergarten is under this red rooftop. Now, what is interesting here is the rooftop because it was used to create an accessible and moving roofscape. There's perhaps less installation or equipment on this roof, but the rooftop topography itself invites children to run, to hide, to climb and together. And last but not least, this is a fantastic example of how a rooftop can be used for recreation and play activities. Now, um, if children get older, teenagers, they love to meet, they want to see, and they want to be seen. Um, this example here is an open space in Stockholm in Sweden, and it's especially loved by girls to meet and to hang around. They can, for example, connect their smartphone to an outdoor speaker system and listen to the favorite music. And at the same time, the colored ground and the facility elements encourage younger children to play, to balance, and to climb. This setting here is uh, targeting and offering intimacy and safety, which are important components of active spaces. Here we see an example of a more formal setting. It's a schoolyard in Canada. And what you see in the middle of the picture um, under this white roof, it's an outdoor classroom, real outdoor classroom in between several sporty areas. Teachers can hold lessons outdoors with protection from sun and rain, while the environment stimulates spontaneous physical activity. Sports users may use the roof place for their belongings or while they take a break from their training sessions. The terrace element in the back may also be used as a gathering place or for assemblies. Getan has already um, told us about the urbanization in the world. So the question always is, or often is, what can you do if everything is already urbanized and you don't find the space? Well, here in Melbourne, a series of several outdoor training areas and playgrounds has been located just next or below a train station of the High Line. These areas are for war sports, for outdoor fitness activities, for skating, for playgrounds and others. And the big uh, positive thing here is anybody traveling by train, the commuters, they can see the different outer areas while they 
but they just well, they aren't aware on, on their on their way to work. So they can see all these outer areas for physical activity and they can feel invited to try them out. And even more people living in other parts of the city, they can easily access these areas within a short time by taking the train. And what if there is some space, but it's not there forever? This picture here shows a flat area in Vancouver belonging to a real estate developer. Sometime in the future, he would like to build some high tower buildings here as those in the back. But the market demand so far has not been there. So the city together with the developer decided to make this place a temporary and colorful pop-up park, including areas for play, basketball and beach volleyball. Everything you see would be removable within only a few days. People from the neighborhood love this place and somehow the facility even increases the value of the already existing real estate. All these examples would not be complete without showing the athletic exploratorium from Denmark. 10 years ago, this place used to be a standardized and boring university track and field facility. The university as the owner and the architects put all their courage together, which is perhaps uh, no surprise as their ancestors were Vikings. So you need a lot of courage to do such a place. Today, this is one of the most active places we at IKS have ever seen. It offers running, skating, jumping, climbing, and many, many other movements in different dimensions and on different levels. The university has opened this facility to the neighborhood and it can be used all day round. Now, which learnings can we take from such examples and such mobilizing spaces? First of all, it needs to be for the community. When you design, when you develop such spaces, invite the users during the design phase. The space is for them. Please listen to their needs let them feel ownership of their place. This will result in a more intensive use later on. Point three, design for play. This means not only play for children, but play for everybody, for every age group. Point four, hang around zones. Implement edge zones for hanging around in addition to activity zones. Not everybody coming to such places wants to be active instantly. Many people, need to sit down first, watch others doing physical activities and then trying out themselves. Don't determine every square meter and leave free space and room for change. It's very important to be able to react on different, on, on changing um, habitudes of physical activity. Think about the surface and the ground. Um, it needs to be robust and playful at, uh, at the same time. So colors are very important. Um, if possible, provide drinking water, provide electricity, and provide Wi-Fi. Use colors, dare to design something temporary, and let people try out their creativity. And ask the architects to use the rooftop as a surface. They often just forget about it. And certainly, such places need to be open to everybody and accessible 24-7. So, design in human dimension for urban nature and for city life. So um, that was my part. If you're interested in more inspiration, please have a look at our magazine. You find it on our website, it's for free. If you want to develop a project, you can find specialized architects and suppliers in the database on the website as well. And if you just want to stay tuned about what we do, subscribe to our email newsletter or follow us on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that, Klaus. That was really inspiring, <laughs> especially thinking about some, some developments here in Liverpool, so that's brilliant. As usual, we'll take questions at the end, so uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Isabella Berger from the UCI, and she's gonna talk about active mo mobility the future of cities worldwide. And I can see uh, the screen is working there, Isabella. So the floor is yours. 
Great. Thank you very much. And, and good morning, everyone. And, and delighted to be here on behalf of the UCI. Um, so before I go into the, the key question for today's presentation, which is, um, is active mobility the future of uh, cities worldwide? I wanted to give you a quick um, overview of the UCI and, and, and what the Federation is. So we're the uh, world governing body for cycling founded in Paris uh, in 1900. Um, we are based here in Switzerland at the UCI World Cycling Center in Egg. Um, so we're based around an international training center and have numerous facilities for athletes around the world here as well. And I guess one of the most important points to, to mention is that um, although we represent a sport, we have both the opportunity and the responsibility to also represent a sport that's also a sustainable, healthy, accessible form of transport. Um, so this has very much to do with, uh, with our overall mission and vision, um, which is to develop our sport in collaboration with our, our 202 national federations as both a competitive sport, but also as, um, as a recreation activity and uh, means of transport. And this is the area that I, I manage within the UCI when it comes to um, cycling for all um, and sustainability. So if we look at today's question, which is, is active mobility the future of cities worldwide? Um, my answer to you will be yes, most definitely yes, and, and why? Um, so what I wanted to share with you first was um, the report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which was uh, published last year, um, which very strongly supports this answer in that um, they stated in the report, which was uh, created by Working Group 3, um, that meeting climate change goals were, require uh, transformative changes in the transport sector. Um, and more specifically, that individual choices taken by, um, by ourselves um, will have the largest potential to reduce carbon footprints. Um, and that uh, takes changes when it comes to social, cultural and behavioral change. Um, now, why I mention this is that the report then um, explained that, um, that cycling and walking are fantastic um, solutions to, uh, to, to meet uh, climate change goals. And they have highlighted that uh, ensuring that there's strong bicycle infrastructure, which is both safe and uh, easy to use, um, will enable more people to cycle. And finally, um, that a shift to cycling will also um, is also directly connected to 11 uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so within the UCI, we very strongly support the fact that the bicycle is a catalyst for climate action. Um, to give you a few numbers here, um, we know that using a bike instead of a car for short trips, and also we know that many trips taken by individuals are less than five kilometers, um, can reduce our travel emissions by around 75%. Um, if we swap uh, a car um, for a bicycle um, just one day a week as a commuting habit um, allows us to reduce our carbon footprint by about half the ton of CO2 over a year. And finally, when it comes to transporting freight and, 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 and stuff as opposed to people, um, cargo bikes also have a, a, an excellent um, uh, opportunity to reduce carbon footprint uh, compared to diesel vans. Um, earlier uh, in the, the presentations, uh, one of the key points that was mentioned was regarding alliances and partnerships. Fiona mentioned this, but other speakers have as well. And what I wanted to share with you as well was an example of an alliance and partnership which came up uh, last year in 2022, which is the PATH Partnership for Active Travel and Health, um, which was really created to support the promotion of cycling and walking and especially around um, COP27 in Egypt, where many of our organizations were present. Um, so here on the slide, you can see the founding members of this partnership, which was launched um, initially by the FIA Foundation, uh, the European Cyclist Federation, WAP21, and the UN Environment. And the UCI was one of the, the founding members when it was launched last year. And the goal of the partnership is really to work together to speak with one voice on behalf of cycling and walking and ensuring that governments take action to um, reduce climate change, but also enable healthier societies um, via the promotion of cycling and walking. 
So again, have uh, some data for you and, uh, and wanted to share some of the, the key points that came up um, within the research and the report that was published by the PATH. Um, so one uh, with less than, uh, or 60% of urban trips in the world are less than five kilometers. Um, and therefore walking and cycling can cover up to 75% of urban trips um, around the world. Another one is that urban trips are expected to double uh, between 2020 and 2050. Um, again, 60% being less than, kilometers, less than five kilometers, um, we can again uh, replace them with cycling and walking if the infrastructures and the programs are in place, of course. Um, speaking of physical activity, walking and cycling 30 minutes a day reduces the risk of premature death by um, 20 to 30 percent. And also um, one of the, the key facts that was also brought up in the PATH report um, was that one in th three women and one in four men worldwide are not physically active enough. And again, we know that cycling and walking, even for commuting purposes or for, for any purposes, um, allow us to uh, benefit from physical activity. So again, another um, another one of the key statistics that was used by the, the partnership uh, in the lead up to COP27. So now that we've looked at, at facts and, and, and um, representing the UCI, uh, what I did want to show you as well was share some of the, the key work that we do within the UCI to support the growth of uh, active cities and, and what tools we have that can hopefully help you yourselves as well um, when it comes to creating an active city with cycling and walking. So the first, um, first element I want, wanted to share was the, the UCI's new Agenda 2030. Um, this was published in September last year at the, after the UCI Congress. It's the UCI's eight-year roadmap up until 2030, um, which was developed in collaboration with all departments. Um, and really the, the objective is to make cycling um, the sport of the 21st century, but also to develop a lifestyle around cycling. And, and this is based on a number of key objectives, uh, one being the development of cycling worldwide, but again, not just the sport, but as a means of transport and um, healthy, accessible uh, physical activity um, and mode of transport. Another key point, uh, which is more sport related is in the innovation of competitions. Uh, we have a solidarity program that helps support um, our smaller federations worldwide. And again, on topics that also have to do with cycling for all. Um, a key point which was also added to Agenda 2030 uh, was the promotion of sustainable cycling. So here we talk about how we can reduce the impact of the sport, but also ensure that we promote cycling as a, as a a tool to combat climate change and, and, and what actions we can take uh, within the Federation to do this. And finally, the protection of athletes and the guarantee of equal opportunity. So um, promoting the, the key elements of uh, diversity, quality, inclusion as well. So this is a document that you can find on our website and um, gives you a, an overview of the actions we plan to take over the next eight years um, and, and just sets uh, really our, our own KPIs and, and objectives moving forward. Um, a few other uh, tools that we published in the last few years, which are, are again, fully accessible on our website and, and hope that they can also help you. Um, one is a toolkit on cycling for all side events. Um, so what we did was gather uh, best practice examples, which are led by a number of our federations and the cities that we work with um, in the promotion of cycling for all. Um, and here you can see the actions that can be taken by a city when it comes to promoting cycling, um, whether it's around a, a cycling competition, but also outside of, um, of, of events. So what are the types of festivals, um, bike to work days, um, events for the public that can be organized to, to promote um, the use of the bicycle. We also have another um, toolkit, which is on children's cycling education, which was developed in collaboration with um, Bikeability in the UK that, that really wrote the content and, and prepared the, all the, uh, the case studies for this, um, this uh, toolkit, which can help um, organizations around the world develop their own children's cycling educations. Um, and then we also have our sustainability guidelines, which were launched in 2021. 
which although they give a blueprint on how to reduce the impact of cycling events, they also have a number of, um, of case studies and uh, of checklists on how to promote um, active mobility. So we made sure to in, uh, we made sure to include um, guidance on how to promote cycling to work, how to promote um, using a bicycle uh, to get to uh, to sporting events, um, and also just more generally how to promote cycling as well. And then finally, um, a digital platform which was created back in 2019 by the Cycling Embassy of Denmark, which we help support, um, is called Cycling Danish solutions and that provides a number of key examples um, and also guidance on how to um, develop cycling cities based on uh, Danish examples and Danish know-how from uh, numerous experts within Denmark. So these are a number of tools that we already have and are available on our website. And then another program that we launched uh, quite a few years ago now um, is the UCI Bike City label. So it's a label that we give to cities and regions that um, host UCI events, but also have very clear strategies to promote cycling amongst the population, um, with our key objective being to uh, create a, a large globally recognized network of cities and regions that are using the sport to also create healthier, safer, more accessible societies um, where anyone, regardless of age or ability, um, can, uh, can cycle. Uh, right now, the current the network uh, includes 22 uh, cities and regions across 14 countries uh, within four continents. Uh, we are, of course, working very hard to make sure that we it is a global um, network. So, looking as well as ensuring we hit all five continents, but also looking at how we can integrate more um, cities and regions from outside of Europe. Um, and these are cities that we currently work with. It's a network we currently work with. Um, the idea being to um, to support these cities with their goal to to promote cycling in all its forms, but also help promote this these cities as examples of best practice. Um, so here we we share um, case studies, examples, um, and knowledge from the different cities and regions. And then when it comes to obtaining the label. Um, that it's based on uh, on 10 different criteria, one being the sporting criteria, which is hosting uh, UCI events, so World Championships, World Cups, but then uh, a series of nine different cycling for all criteria, which are, are really, in, really there to ensure that there's a, a wide comprehensive focus that includes a long-term strategy, funding, focus on children, focus on road safety, on infrastructures, um, on sustainability and also measuring and monitoring, which was also men me mentioned by Tafisa earlier today in terms of being a very key part of uh, promoting active cities. So once a city comes to us um, presenting all of the, the data around these different criteria, we are able to, um, to award them with the Bike City label. And just wanted to give you a quick example here um, with uh, Wollongong. Uh, we often talk about cities in, in the Netherlands, in, in Denmark. Um, and here I wanted to give you a slightly different example uh, from Australia, uh, from the city of Wollongong, just outside of Sydney, um, which we have been working with very closely for the last two years, um, as they were hosting the UCI Road World Championships last year um, in September. And as part of their um, both their sustainability strategy, but also their overall plan, their legacy plan. They were looking at how they can use the UCI uh, World Championships to um, create a, a healthier, safer, uh, more active city. So what they did was um, develop a cycling strategy 2030. This is the document you can see here on the slide, which is also accessible um, on on their website. I, I highly encourage you to look up this document. It's really interesting in terms of their objectives, their plans, um, the key metrics they're looking at as well. And so um, this whole strategy was fully supported by the entire um, city council. We had the opportunity to actually meet with them in September during the World Champs and um, basically mo mobilizing all areas of, uh, of both the government, but also private and, and, and public um, um, 
levels as well to, to support the development of cycling, which includes both uh, increasing infrastructure for cycling, and that's safe infrastructures for cycling, um, but also uh, developing um, programs and, and opportunities for people to ride. Um, so we had a absolutely fantastic uh, journey with Wollongong up to the Road World Championships, and now we're following um, after the Road Worlds, the work that they're doing now to, to increase the number of people cycling. Um, so just a, a slightly different example from what we normally hear uh, when we speak about cycling cities. So uh, one I, I certainly encourage you to look at. Um, so that brings me to the my time's over, brings me to the end of, of the presentation, but happy to, uh, to answer any questions you might have after this. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Isabella. Um, as I mentioned before, we'll take questions from the Q&A and from the chat um, at the end of this session. So I'll move on to our next uh, set of speakers. So I'm really pleased to welcome Danny Woodworth from Merseyside Sport Partnership, Vicky Marshall from Liverpool School uh, Sport Partnership and Nikki Gates from um, Liverpool City Council. It's great to see you guys, your local guys here today. Um, so please, the floor is yours. I'll let you know when you've got a minute to go, okay? Thank you. Thanks, great stuff. So uh, great to be here today, folks. Um, great to see some faces and names that are familiar and uh, some new faces and names. Um, I'm Nikki Yates. I work within Liverpool City Council uh, as the Strategic Physical Activity and Sports Development Manager, which is really the best job in the world, except Jürgen Klopp's, but I probably won't ever manage Liverpool, so there you go. Um, I'm really delighted today uh, to talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing over the past few years uh, in Liverpool to engage uh, some specific audiences of people as part of our Liverpool Active City uh, strategy. Um, and to do that with a couple of uh, fantastic colleagues of mine uh, from partner organisations that, that we work with here um, in the city as well. Um, just to say that in Liverpool at the moment, according to our Sport England data, there are around 30% of the population who are defined as inactive. So that's adults who are not achieving 30 minutes of physical activity a week and children, young people not achieving 30 minutes of physical activity in a typical day. So that's something that we very much want to tackle in Liverpool uh, to transform lives and transform communities because we know how uh, impactful moving every day can be on everyone's lives, as, as our speakers uh, before me have already said. So. Firstly, we are going to hear from my colleague, Vicky Marshall, who works with Liverpool School Sport Partnership. And Vicky is going to talk to us about some of the fantastic work taking place in partnership with schools. Over to you, Vicky. Thanks, Nikki. Um, lovely to be here today. Um, as Nikki said, uh, I'm here today representing Liverpool School Sport Partnership. Uh, we've got over 20 years experience working with uh, primary um, schools and secondary schools across the city, uh, engaging um, them to, to enable their children to be more physically active. Thanks, Nikki. So Liverpool School Sport Partnership, um, fondly known as LSSP, uh, was born out of a, a, a government um, physical education, school sport and club link strategy. Um, which ran between 2001 and 2011 and engaged uh, and funded um, all schools in England. Um, those SSPs were partnerships of schools which were designed to increase the quality and quantity um, of PE and sports opportunities. Uh, they were managed by a, um, a partnership development manager uh, working with, with staff within those schools. At that stage, Liverpool had four SSPs uh, across the city. Um, when funding was withdrawn from the government in 2011, uh, the local head teachers in the city um, voted for the partnerships to continue. So we became a self-financing, um, uh, you know, had, we had a self-financing model uh, and we also have now a new um, strap line, uh, which is happy, healthy and active children. So we run a subscription kind of service um, for schools. So um, 
now we've only got um, there's obviously a new government strategy uh, in place um, and part of that strategy is the, the school games program of which we feed into uh, and that brings about 20 percent of our funding um, you know so we're aligned with with national strategy um, but as a um, as an organization we now have over 35 staff working with 79 percent of schools across the city um, alongside our school subscription service, we also have um, a charity, um, which also allows us to um, um, run bespoke um, funded projects, um, some of which I'll, I'll share with you today. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah, keep going. So we know, obviously, as, as Nikki said, um, and uh, colleagues before, we, we have a huge challenge, you know, in the, um, you know, the enormity of the task, trying to make every you know, to, to enable every child to be physically active uh, following the WHO guidance and the, um, the recently um, updated uh, Chief Medical Officer's guidance. Um, the, the 60 active minutes is what we work very closely with schools on. Uh, and as part of um, their, um, the government strategy, um, the, the UK government strategy at the moment, uh, which provides uh, PE and school sports um, funding in the form of premium to every primary school, um, they, part of that funding um, is for every um, child to access 30 minutes of physical activity and that's separate to, um, to curriculum PE. So that's one of their requirements for, for accessing that grant. Um, if you keep clicking through these please Nikki, um, just some of those stats that Nikki, you know that this is a real tall order for us as partners in the city and we can't achieve this on our own. Uh, we work really really closely with, uh, with partners in the city, many of whom are on the call today, um, you know John Moores, um, Youth Sport Trust, uh, Liverpool City Council, uh, we're all tasked with, with um, trying to come together um, and work collaboratively together. And we have a, um, a what we call it fondly is the, the PESPA group, which brings all those partners together to try and tackle this um, inactivity and problems we have with um, you know, ch um, children's uh, weight. We also know that from national data that we, you know, children's well-being is suffering uh, and with one, of, one in six young people suffering from mental health problems. Thanks, Nikki. So um, we've been working obviously with schools for a very long time. Um, we, we use um, this um, Public Health England um, piece of documentation, which is um, what works well in schools and colleges to increase physical activity. Uh, we started working with schools on this around 2012. It's since been updated, but this is some of the features that we recognize when we work with a, a, an active school. Um, you, know, we, you know, the ethos of the school, they really do embrace, you know, PE school sport physical activity from all levels, right from a buy in from their senior leadership team to a, a knowledgeable and experienced PE lead who leads a, a team of people across the team, across the school. Um, they have a strategic plan that encompasses not just their PE curriculum, you know, which is that timetable time, which sometimes, you know, for some children, it's the only time that they'll be able to be physically active. But it also embraces school sport and also physical activity. And the physical activity might align with other subject areas, things like active learning, active maths, uh, the daily mile, you know, again, the class out every day, experiencing the, the great outdoors uh, and other intervention programmes. Um, obviously, active environment is there um, and Klaus showed us a great picture in there about, um, you know, an, an active school and how that can work. Uh, thanks, Nikki. So what I thought I'd do just for a, a couple of moments is just to share with you some of the, um, the, the, the things that we work with schools very closely on. And these are only a handful of our, uh, our programmes um, and they do link to, um, you know, to some of the stuff that people have already been talking about already and you know, turning that policy into practice. So one of those programmes is our Learn to Ride, um, Balanceability, Scoot School. Um, and I've just put some of the evidence of what our, you know, our, our customers, our teachers, our, our children are telling us about those programmes. Uh, it's a six week programme, Learn to, to Cycle. Uh, it's aimed at the younger children in the school uh, with the aim of developing fundamental movement skills and encouraging active travel. Interesting this afternoon, um, picking up on Isabella's point about um, you know, children's education around cycling. Uh, I've got a meeting with the Liverpool City Region Active um, Transport um, Unit about how, how we can play a part in, in uh, enabling more children to, you know, to, to find a love of, of cycling. Um, the Power Programme, um, this is an intervention programme aimed at uh, Key Stage 2, six-week programme around health and wellbeing. It's getting children to think about their physical and their mental health, um, you know, and, and, and that links to the Northwest um, Cancer Research, um, and we, we do some work closely with, with those guys as well. 
Um, oh, last year, just an example, we had 2,800 children that took part in that. And of the sample group, 85% said that it reported that an increase in the number of, of minutes they were physically active as a result of, uh, of that programme. A secondary school project we've got going, uh, we have, it's called I Am Programme. Um, it's a behaviour intervention programme, which um, uses specialist um, instructors in combat-based fitness and CrossFit alongside yoga and meditation. Um, and it supports disaffected um, 14, 15 year olds uh, to re-engage with learning. Um, it uses a behaviour for learning concept, um, you know, a range of coping, reflection, goal setting strategies. Thanks, Nikki. Just a final few programmes. We've got an employability programme, which is about finding my potential. Um, you know, it's that kind of developing employability and leadership skills, confidence and, and self-belief, 14, 15 year olds. Uh, and we do this through a training programme of team building, leadership activities, uh, a young mental health champions training. Um, and they also get training around safeguarding first aid and national governing body qualifications. And the aim of that is that they then you know, are equipped to go and run a, a youth club style nurture club for younger children in their own settings. Um, last year, we had for over 427 leaders uh, and we ran um, 250 um, nurture clubs. Uh, and the reports from that is, you know, the improvement of self-confidence and more effective communication. Um, finally, um, just two other things in terms of, you know, we have a whole team of, um, of LSSP um, specialist staff that go into schools and providing support to existing um, members of staff in schools or new staff. Uh, and we run a, um, an apprenticeship training program as well to, you know, to lead on from those young leaders and keep, you know, the young people kind of in the city and preparing them, you know, and, and giving them work opportunities um, and the next generation of, of coaches and physical activity uh, leaders. Thanks, Nikki. Last slide. Um, so with the sport of schools, um, you know, school, we know that schools can be in instrumental in the role they play in developing uh, children and young people's habits for life. Being an active school provides opportunities that not only help children to retain um, healthy weight, but also impact on their physical and mental health and reducing the problems of, of social isolation. Also improves though, learning, um, progress, achievement, memory and concentration skills, so concentration levels. Um, physical activity helps our children to be happy, healthy, and as well as helping to save um, money for the health service and impacting on individuals and communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicky. Um, fantastic to hear about all the work that you are driving as LSSP with all of our PESPA partners in the city as well. Um, just to say that we're really lucky in Liverpool that we still have a school sport partnership. Not every area of England has one. And we're really lucky that we have such passionate people like Vicky who are driving that organisation and all the work that they do. So we're really proud of, of all of the work you're doing, Vicky, and with, with all of our colleagues. And, and we, we're really happy to be working in partnership with you as well. Just absolutely brilliant. So we hope we can continue that for years to come as well. So next, I'm really delighted to introduce Danny Woodworth from MSP to talk about the Liverpool Active Workplaces Programme, another settings-based approach, if you like, to target people in sedentary job roles. Danny, I'll hand over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Nikki. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Danny. I work for MSP, which is Merseyside Sports Partnership. And we are the active, um, active partnership for the Liverpool City region. Um, we work at a strategic level to promote sport and physical activity, but we wanted to spend a little bit of time today talking about some of the collaborative work that we've done in Liverpool around workplace physical activity. Uh, next slide, please, Nikki. I think the, the real um, sort of benefit and the, the real strength of this programme that we run was the collaborative approach that we took in the city. So you have Liverpool City Council, which is the local government. You had at the time Liverpool CCG, which um, who, who were responsible for the local health budget and ourselves at MSP all coming together and recognising the impact that a workplace physical activity programme can have. So we know within Liverpool, there's just over 250,000 people in employment. And if you're looking at, at scale opportunities for behaviour change and to put across positive messages about physical activity, 
that the workplace is a, is a massive opportunity to do that. So as part of the Liverpool Active City strategy, um, the council commissioned two workplace programmes in 2016 and 2020 um, that I'll kind of talk through some of the outcomes really briefly. Um, we know from the data, sport, Sporting Men data shows that 36% of all working age adults in Liverpool don't do enough physical activity. And obviously the impact of COVID-19, more people working from home has, um, has increased that statistic and also increased the amount of time that we spend sedentary in our jobs as well. From a, a workplace or an employer point of view, um, we know that physical activity can have a massive benefit on staff health and well-being, on absenteeism levels, on communication and morale. So it's kind of like a win-win opportunity for both um, employers, employees, and the wider strategy as well. Next slide, please, Nikki. Um, so what, what we were able to achieve from the two, two kind of relatively short commissioned um, programmes was a fantastic network of organisations from across Liverpool that committed to promoting physical activity within the workplace. So I've got a cu couple of logos of organisations on screen there. So your big employers, which are the local NHS trust, the council, our universities who all employ 5,000 plus staff, plus some really prominent brands and um, important organisations from across the city. It's fantastic to have their support. Next slide, please, Nikki. Um, now, I know that we're short on time, so I'm not going to go through all of the different outcomes that we've achieved from the programme. Um, what we can share with you is two evaluation reports that's, that drills down some of the detail of all of the outcomes that we're able to achieve. But just to give you a little bit of a flavour, in the first programme that we delivered, um, we delivered some champion training, um, some step challenges, some small grant programmes. And what we're able to achieve, um, that you can see from the stats, is some great individual outcomes for employees in terms of increasing physical activity levels, increasing their mental health and wellbeing, um, reducing the amount of time that we spent off sick, but also in terms of a, a wider strategic impact, we were able to demonstrate a social return on investment for the programme so that for every one pound that was invested, um, there was just under a 15 pound return on investment, which I think shows the potential and the impact that investing in workplace physical activity can provide from both a commissioning perspective and from an individual organisation perspective as well. Next slide, please, Nikki. And then in 2020, COVID hit and COVID changed absolutely everything for quite a lot of organisations. Um, we were due to deliver the second Liverpool Active Workplaces programme just before COVID hit. Um, so what we use the, the start of COVID as a, a really good opportunity to pause and reflect and engage with workplaces around how COVID has affected their working patterns, how their staff engage with well-being and with physical activity um, during the start of the pandemic and the impact that home working had. So this chart shows quite beautifully and quite starkly really the impact that COVID had with um, staff health and well-being within organisations. So it shows kind of no surprise really that it's good to have the evidence there that staff felt more disconnected from each other, their activity levels went down, they were more sedentary and really, really importantly, that bottom bar shows the impact it had on staff mental health and well-being. And I suppose what we wanted to use physical activity um, as a tool to, to kind of reduce or to change around some of those statistics. So for example, um, encouraging teams to come back together, doing socially distant activities, but using physical activity or using physical activity as a way to get people doing things in teams to improve that connectivity that was lost during COVID. And I think as a standalone piece of research, this was really, really valuable at the time to help inform what was delivered as part of the second Liverpool Active Workplaces programme. 
Next slide, please, Nikki. And again, I'm not going to go into the detail of all the outcomes from all the different interventions that we um, that we saw during during this second program. But we provided more training, different interventions that were based around that team element that we know um, was a real demand after coming through COVID and the effects that that had on working. There's loads of evidence there around the difference that it made to staff physical activity levels, to um, communication, morale, absenteeism. We also tried a few different things um, to help bridge the gap between working from home and maybe what staff used to have access to in the office. So rather than provide in on-site physical activity classes, we provided a range of different inclusive videos that staff could access whilst working from home, access to things like pedometers, resistance bands, um, something that came out really strongly from the first Liverpool Active Workplaces programme was um, some peer-to-peer -peer training that we delivered because we know that word of mouth is the most effective way to communicate within a workplace. And often um, messages about physical activity are better received from colleagues rather than, than from management or HR. So we continued that in this second programme, but we also built on it by delivering some manager training so that, that we, we often get the culture from the top endorsing in physical activity in the workplace. You get the demand from staff, but that middle layer of management who almost have that authority to set the culture around whether it being acceptable or not to be active during the working day to be flexible we trialed that as part of this program um, with some some really good success around how that changes workplace culture like i said there's some evaluation reports that go into far more detail than i can share now if if you're interested in having a look at that next slide please go, guys please thank you yeah, next slide, please, Nikki. So just really quickly, um, as well as the individual programmes that were delivered in Liverpool, now um, locally our NHS, our health system has gone through um, has gone through change. We're now working on larger geographical footprints that for Liverpool is now part of Cheshire and Merseyside. And workplace physical activity is being identified as part of the health physical activity strategy called Altogether Active. Um, that you can have a look at. So it's really good to see that, that that's been uh, included in that. Next slide, please, Nikki. In terms of next steps, we've got a legacy of individual organisations who have committed to supporting physical activity. And I think we've got some work to do at a strategic level to influence those organisations within the city that have got an influence on the business community so that that's sustained and grown even further. Um, and it's great to see that this work's contributed towards Liverpool gaining the, the Global Active Cities accreditation. And um, just once again, thanks for the opportunity to, to share. I'll pass back to you, Nikki. Thanks, Danny. Again, we're really proud of all the work that we've done together. I think we've, we've seen some fantastic work across workplaces and absolutely we hope that that is going to um, be maintained as our approach going forward as well as one of the strategic things that we do. Over to you, Lynn. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much for that presentation. It was really interesting to hear from all three of our really key partners in the city and, and beyond. Um, we've now got time for a few questions. I've got quite a long list of questions here for all our speakers. So I thought I'll just ask everyone a couple of questions. And, and if I can, if you could if all our speakers could have a look at the Q&A that's open and have a look at the chat and, and answer any questions there that we don't have time to ask just now, if, if, if you would do that, that would be really appreciated. OK, so I'll, I'll go to Klaus first as our first speaker. And I've got a question to you from the chat, which was, have you got any examples um, for winter climates for the, the kind of active outdoor spaces? Um, well, yes, because there's a lot of examples from uh, Nordic countries or from Canada, and they are kind of winter climate countries. So, um, yes, certainly we have that in our database, in our magazine. So if, if there is a specific interest, please contact me and I can provide some examples. And what sort of additional considerations might there be 
And we had another question from chat from the chat around things like waste management, electricity supply, other infrastructure that might be needed. So just yes. wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, yeah, waste management is always a topic because I think, as you all should have understood, these places uh, that are designed for physical activity, they are meeting places, they are places to, to socialize. So waste is always around. So yes, please think about it. Um, and um, talking about, um, well, colder climates or even hotter climates, I think roofing is always a main issue. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's uh, many good examples of um, constructions that offer roofs, but are still kind of, there are no walls around. It's just a roof. It protects you from, from rain, from sun. So, uh, and it, it, it's a place to meet again. It, it's, you don't always need to be physically active. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just meeting your friends, um, talking, communicating, and perhaps doing some activity. And thank you for that question. There was, there was one more question as well around the co-production or the involvement of the neighborhoods in the planning phase. I wonder if you've got any examples of, of where that worked particularly well or the, the type of activities that, that um, are involved in, in, in bringing those people into the discussions. Yes, I mean, there is, there is a couple of countries in the world who have uh, very regular participation processes when it comes to planning public buildings or public places. For example, mm -hmm. in Canada, they do that a lot. And uh, there's examples that clearly show when you involve the neighborhood into the planning uh, phase, um, people feel understood, people feel uh, to be taken seriously in, in, in what they need for their daily life. And at the end of the process, they feel a strong ownership of the new place, of the new building, and the result is that they do use it. It's, it's, it's their place. And if, if it's their place, um, they, they also support it. They, they, there is some social control. So it's, it's, it's not a place that will be neglected because the neighborhood takes care of it. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Co-development is a really important thing in research and in lots of projects. So it's really great to see that, you know, the, the benefit of that on the ground and how it, how it does have a huge impact on on how a facility is developed and how it is used and, and the longevity of that as well. So thank you very much for that, Klaus. Isabella, I wonder if I could ask you a couple of questions and there's some more in, in the chat and in the Q&A for you as well. Um, I guess one was, one that came in through the, the question and answer section was, how does the UCI work with cities to help develop their sort of cycling infrastructure, their cycling profile? Do you work directly with city councils and municipalities or is it through the national federations? Um, it's a bit of both. So we'll work directly with cities and regions that come to us when it comes to the bike city label. Um, so when the city comes and says, you know, we're hosting the, um, you know, you say world champs next year in, in four years, and we'd be interested to um, to receive the bike city label, then we work directly on one to one basis with them. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, we won't pretend to be urban planners either. So we're not the ones that will be, you know, sharing plans on how to develop cycling infrastructure. What we do do is share examples of what is done by other cities and, and we can share guidance and, and tools that we have. Uh, but then the actual kind of expertise comes from, um, you know, either organizations that they'll work with or experts that they have within the city to develop the cycling infrastructure. Um, we also send them to, to known experts such as the, um, the Dutch Cycling Embassy or the Cycling Embassy of Denmark that have the, the tools and resources to, to, to uh, support cities in the development of cycling infrastructure. Um, and then in some cases, our national federations are quite active. It, it varies between countries. In some cases, um, some of our national federations are very much focused only on the sport and, and only have the staff and the resources to, to focus on that element. Um, in other cases, we have federations that are also involved more on the transport side. Um, one great example is British Cycling that has been doing a lot of work to, to promote um, active mobility as well and, and have a, a policy officer and, and have been very active in terms of, uh, of supporting the, the growth the growth of cycling as a form of, of transport, but that very much varies between our national federations. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. And a, a question just from me, really, 
Um, are there any quick wins or things that are really simple investments or simple actions that a city could potentially take to try and promote cycling in their municipalities? Um, so two elements which are often brought up by cities are, are, are behaviour change and infrastructure. So on the one hand, you won't get more people riding if you don't have safe infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you have the infrastructure, you actually need to, to promote the use of it and, and create the programmes to do that. So not sure if it's a quick win, but, um, but we do have cities that have found you know, very quick ways to implement safe cycling infrastructure. We, did, we do have lots of examples from COVID. Um, from the what we call the COVID bike lanes and cities working very quickly um, on tactical urbanism to bring in solutions to allow people to, to ride their bikes in a, in a safe way um, during the, the COVID restrictions. Um, so that we have seen work um, in terms of infrastructures and then in terms of programs, um, you know, that the cities that we work with have implemented very quick programs, whether it's you know creating cycling festivals for children, creating um, bike to work schemes, um, having uh, cycling education for um, for elderly people as well. You know, it's ensuring that you cover off kind of the whole range of of abilities and ages, and making sure that anyone can learn to ride a bike. Um, so, just a few aspects, perhaps maybe not as quick as as one would <laughs> like, but. Um, but definitely if, if I developed in partnership with other organizations, um, it can move quicker. Brilliant, thank you. And one really interesting question that came in on chat, and it was it was to everybody, but I thought I might pose it to you, Isabella, is what's the thoughts on the introduction or, or mass trials of electric scooters and electric bikes in a lot of cities, in, in especially in Europe? Um, what's your thoughts on those? So when it comes to, to, to e-bikes, um, certainly a game changer. Um, we see on the one hand that they reduce the notion of, of distance and time. Um, so it allows people that wouldn't necessarily have the, um, the ability to ride longer distances or, or, or longer um, periods or even you know, climb hills. Um, lots of hilly cities. I mean, we have Lausanne right next door. Um, not everyone would be able to commute back and forth to work um, climbing a, a huge hill, whereas um, e-bikes uh, really reduce those, uh, those those constraints. And we have seen a huge jump in terms of, of users um, using e-bikes as, as a form of commuting. Um, and also looking at the market, um, e-bikes are, are the fastest growing uh, segment within um, within the bicycle sale. So, um, one other change that has come is also within um, bike sharing systems within cities. So not everyone can afford a bike um, or not everyone has access to one, but a lot of the bike share systems have now implemented e-bikes as well. Um, we see that here in Switzerland, a lot of the, the hillier cities now have e-bikes and, and those are very popular amongst people that uh, want to move around the city, not necessarily having their own bike, but using the bike sharing system, which now allows them to, to move around um, by a, a electrical assistance. Mm -hmm. okay, if I may if I may add something, Lynn, I, yeah. I would say the e-bikes the e themselves, they are, not, uh, they are not changing the world. Um, it's the determination of space. So town planners, they need to take a decision about three lane roads, uh, and take away one lane and give them mm -hmm. to the cyclist and, and, and they need to reduce the, the space for cars. Yeah, they need to do this. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, and, and, and we see, uh, I'll use a local example, we've seen some quite radical changes in some major routes in the city centre of Liverpool and, it, and it's quite amazing seeing some genuine cycle lanes in the city where they are separate from, from the traffic and that I know used to put me off cycling a lot but I can see those positive changes in Liverpool and it's really nice to see. So yeah, so things are happening. Um, so that's good. Okay, I'm going to move down and ask the um, Liverpool guys some a couple of questions. So Vicky, I wanted to ask you first, if that's okay, what's the single biggest challenge at the moment in working with schools to try and promote physical activity? And I know that's a really difficult question, so <laughs> apologies. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, we think we're, I think um, I think physical activity at the moment is is really well positioned against the whole mental health agenda, mm. um, and a lot of schools, you know, obviously coming out of of COVID, um, 
you know, are starting to really appreciate, you know, that, that children need to be physically active and they need the outdoors. So uh, they're really thinking, you know, really hard about what they do within their own settings and to enable that to happen. Um, in terms of challenges, I think um, um, the, the volume of, of things that are, are within schools, uh, the volume of different initiatives and, and this lack of joined up thinking. I think the schools mm. that really succeed in this really think about, you know, where they, they join, you know, they, they don't make, make you know, um, extra work and extra opportunities it actually dovetails with stuff they're already doing so for example maths you know if they the target groups of children that you know um, need additional uh, maths but they make it through the physical so it becomes physical activity becomes embedded you know into their plans i suppose the other challenge is short-term funding um i think um you know uh, short-term and um funding decisions that come in late um, from from government I think sometimes don't help because schools don't know you know they'll get a decision kind of you know middle of July that funding is going to happen for, for September it doesn't allow them to plan uh, and then they'll get a one-year funding slot again so they can't plan for for long term um, so I think those probably the, are the main challenges at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay brilliant thank you I'll come back to you in a minute but Danny uh, we got a question in from um, the, the Q&A uh, board what was the what were Liverpool City Council? What was Liverpool City Council's involvement in in the Workplace Active scheme that you, that Merseyside Sport Partnership were running? Um, yeah, I, I don't know if Nick, Nicky might want to jump in because I know Nicky's put a, a response in the chat that that kind of quite comprehensively covers it actually. So I might maybe just go on if, if it's okay to Laura's second question, just around uh, whether employers cover the cost of programmes. Um, so for the two commission programmes that I kind of briefly shared some of the outcomes from, um, most of the costs were covered within that commission programme. But as part of the legacy and sustainability of it, what we tried to do was influence those employers to then invest in it themselves afterwards. And um, to, to be fair, we, we've had quite a lot of employers that have done that and we've got some great um, case studies and outcomes that we can share from that. I think the struggle is obviously private sector organisations are going to be a much better place to do that than public sector organisations who you know have tight budgets, um, reduced income over the last 13 years. So but for some organisations, that's easier than others. But I think um, another piece of work that we did through the programme was to produce a toolkit which is a little bit of a how-to guide for organisations as to how they can implement physical activity within the workplace. And a lot of the information and advice within there um, was about things that they could do that doesn't incur a cost. So lots of different initiatives that they can introduce that's got either zero or, or minimal cost or capacity needed to, to get stuff off the ground. So a bit, bit of a long-winded answer to say, a little bit of both. Um, we know that ideally businesses should be providing more investment into the staff for stuff like this. We know there's a return on investment. And I think the evidence that we've helped to collect as part of the two commission programmes should help organisations to, um, you know, maybe come to the sensible decision that they should be investing more for staff as activity. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Danny. Um, Nikki, if I come to you, I wondered, I'm, I'm going to set you up for a question that will lead into something later on. How, how useful it is that, that the City Council has adopted or, or Liverpool Act City Strategy adopted the kind of evidence-based practice model quite a long time ago. How, how useful you find that and how we use that going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, you know, something, you know me well, it's something that I'm really passionate about um it i mean using an evidence base you know as, as, as simply as you can put it, uh, it it stops us trying to reinvent all the time when we may not need to and yes we do need to innovate uh we do need to think differently and review regularly but we also i think need to be even better than we currently are at using the evidence um i think we're only part way along that journey but I think that sometimes we jump straight to let's try something new 
before we've actually looked at you know the the actual evidence base so i just think it it, it reduces that duplication and you know some in some ways some wasted effort you know in terms of trying to learn what might work or what might fail um i think also when you're making decisions it's much easier to influence the decision makers if you've got a really robust body of evidence to support what you're saying and, and your, your, your business case. So I think from that point of view as well, it's really, really important that we always consider the evidence, but we also build on that as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think we can probably leave it there because there's there's lots of questions um, coming in on the Q&A. So if I could ask the speakers just to, to have a look at the Q&A and to answer what you can and also have a look at the chat, that would be brilliant. It's great that this has generated so much discussion and so many questions. So it'd be really brilliant to carry that on. So I'm just going to say thank you so much to all the speakers this morning in both of the sessions. It's been a really interesting start to the day. We've now got um, a break built into the uh, programme and we're back here again at uh, 1 p.m. So we'll be due to start again at 1 p.m. sharp. So you've got a bit of time to get some lunch, have a break. Um, those of you that can't join us this afternoon, thank you for being here this morning. It's been lovely to see so many people um, interested in this work. Uh, and for everybody else, hopefully we'll see you this afternoon. So thank you very much uh, for everyone's involvement this morning. Thank you, Lynn. Can I just confirm that that's 1 p.m. UK time? So we've got about uh, uh, an hour and 20 minutes before the, the session. So if people can join, jump back in about five minutes, that would be uh, fantastic. Thank you from, from all of us, and we'll see you uh, shortly, and we'll get on to some of the questions online. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've uh, had a, a little bit of break, respite, and maybe a little bit of physical activity during the, uh, the break between sessions. Uh, we're going to continue with two more sessions this afternoon. Again, hopefully some really interesting insights into different parts of the world. The first session is being chaired by Michael Gross from Avalio. Uh, Michael's been with the uh, Global Active City programme for, for many years. Uh, so I'll pass you over to Michael to uh, to run this session. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much, Keith. And thank you very much, the whole team of Liverpool Jomo University, as well as, as colleagues from Tafisa, of course. Um, I'm honored to, to moderate this session this afternoon with three wonderful persons that had the, uh, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, the past years uh, working with the Active Wellbeing Initiative, the Global Active City Approach and Certification. Um, so the, the first presentation will be from Elizabeth Ayers from the um, city of Richmond, uh, British Columbia, Canada. Unfortunately for professionals obligations uh, and also the time difference with West Canada, she were not able to attend live so she uh, provided to us um, a video uh, speaking about her presentation. So um, I will share the, the video with you. And of course, at the end of the, the session, we, 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 we can speak about uh, some, some questions related to, to this presentation. Uh, I can see the screen. The video is not started yet, though. OK, perfect. Here we go. Good morning. Yep. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful event which celebrates the bicentenary of Liverpool John Moores University, as well as the Global Active City Initiative, which is delivered by Avalio and Tafisa working in partnership. I've been asked to share with you a little bit about Richmond's journey as a global active city. I will share with you some of our successes, some of the opportunities, and what I see for us as our path forward as a global active city. I'm Elizabeth Ayers, and I'm the General Manager of Community Services with the City of Richmond. I've been with this initiative almost since the outset of it, and I led the team through the accreditation process and continue to provide strategic leadership and support for the team on our journey as a global active city. To provide context, I think it's helpful to know a little bit about the City of Richmond. And we are on a 
We're a city on the west coast of British Columbia in Canada. We have a population of about 230,000 people. We're home to the Vancouver International Airport, and we also have the Canada Line, which connects us directly to downtown Vancouver. We are a unique island city made up of 17 individual islands, and as you can see here, geographically, we are very flat, so we are also a very accessible city. We are the second most diverse community in Canada, uh, where 80% of our population identifies as a visible minority. Within this, we have just over 44% of the population that report Chinese as their mother tongue. Historically, our city was a fishing and farming community, but like other cities, we've uh, experienced very rapid growth over the last number of years. And in particular, this growth is the result of our intention to leverage the Olympic opportunity to create a better city. With the award of the Long Track Speed Skating Oval for the 2010 Olympic Games, our strategy and intention was simple from the outset. Plan for the post games and legacy first. We delivered a beautiful venue for the 2010 Olympic Games, but we also made sure that we were intentional and focused on delivering value to the community for the long term by creating a center of excellence for sport and wellness. With the Olympics, we also negotiated the extension of a rapid transit system into our downtown core, which allowed us to create a new city center area with increased density all along that, that uh, transportation corridor. This has created a really vibrant and dense city centre, which continues to grow and evolve today. It has new parks, public infrastructure, and significant public art. Richmond was asked to, to join the Global Active City Initiative at its inception. As an Olympic venue city, we were recognized as a leader in international sport and active communities for our of a true legacy of community benefit with the Richmond Olympic Oval. We were also recognized for our strong policies, our plans, and our programs and services related to the, to the delivery of sport and recreation, facility development, and community involvement. We were one of the stakeholders that was involved in developing the standard for the Global Active City Initiative, and we were then invited to be one of the first cities certified. We reviewed that opportunity carefully and we decided to pursue certification. We thought it was a strategic opportunity to continue to leverage the legacy of the 2010 Olympic Games to enhance our work in creating a more active, healthy, and connected community. Through the Global Active City Initiative, we've had the opportunity to both share our learnings, but also to learn from other global leaders about the promotion of health and well being for our residents. Whether you are a global active city already, or you're considering that journey to become one, you will be aware that a PASA management system for your city is one of the core components of becoming accredited. Our approach to the PASA management system in Richmond was to look at work that we already had in place or work that we were in the process of, of creating. The focal point or inspiration for all of our work in the city of Richmond is our vision, which is to be the most appealing, livable, and well-managed community in Canada. We use numerous tools and strategies to identify both short and long-term goals towards achieving this vision. We have two strategies in particular uh, that guide our work as a global active city and that lead us towards that vision, that city vision our community wellness and recreation and sports strategies. First, the community wellness strategy takes a collaborative and holistic approach to improving wellness for Richmond residents. And this strategy was developed in partnership with both our health authority and our school district. And together, senior leaders from across all three organizations continue to provide leadership for the implementation of this strategy. This strategy recognizes that wellness Wellness is more than just physical activity. It also encompasses mental wellness, healthy eating, and social connectedness. This, the recreation and sports strategy focuses on the physical activity component of wellness. 
while also recognizing that, of course, physical activity provides much more to an ind individual than just physical health. At its core is the Sport for Life model, which embraces active start, physical literacy, and active for life. We put a significant emphasis on the development of physical literacy skills in all of our programs, knowing that developing physical literacy skills at a young age will really help our residents to be active and healthy for a lifetime. So together, the community wellness strategy and recreation sports strategy together are our foundation for the Global Active City Initiative or our PASA management system. In terms of learnings, for those of you who aren't certified yet, I have a couple of quick learnings for you. The first is that the teams at Tafisa and Avalio, as well as the certified cities across the globe, are all there to support you in your work as you embark on the journey of certification. All you need to do is ask. The second learning is that while we are all focused on the same outcome, which is to increase physical activity levels and the well-being of citizens, we will all have very unique and individual approaches to meeting the standards for the global active city. At first, the process and the certification system might seem quite daunting, quite stringent, but I can assure you that there's great latitude in how your city will meet those standards. Your approach needs to make sense for your community. So what has worked well for Richmond in the implementation of our PASA management system? I'd like to say that underlying all of our work are four fundamental factors that I think are key to our success. Partnerships, continued investment in infrastructure development, a strategic focus on the delivery of programs and services, and community involvement in the planning and delivery of our programs and services. Together, these factors really work in combination to amplify the impact of any specific action or initiative. I will touch on each briefly. Partnerships. As opportunities arise, one of the first things that we do as an organization is ask ourselves, are we the right organization to be involved in this? Or who else should be involved and who else should we, should we be working with? As a result, we work with a large number of organizations, as I've already mentioned, including our school district and health department, as well as for-profit societies across our city. We recognize that by working together, our impact on the community has the potential to be so much greater. We all know that saying that the whole is so much greater than the sum of the parts. Well, I really believe that we lead this, live this practice every single day. The next area, infrastructure and urban design, uh, or PASA centers. Our city council is committed to the provision of parks, open spaces, sport amenities, and recreation facilities, knowing that to meet the needs of our growing and diverse community, they need to invest in these critical um, facilities. Annually, our council commits funds both to maintain our existing infrastructure and to add new uh, facilities and infrastructure. A couple of quick examples. The most recent facility that we've opened is the Minimum Center for Active Living. And this facility combines a state-of-the-art aquatic and fitness facility with an older adult or senior center. This 10,300 square meter facility is a center for active living where residents of all ages can come together to play, to exercise, and to connect with their community. An outdoor example is our railway greenway. And, and this is a railway corridor that we created a nine kilometer, um, a, a nine kilometer walking, cycling and, and uh, um, rolling path. And all along this path, our residents also find heritage sites, resting spots, um, community gardens. And just recently, we also added a bike park along this nine kilometer corridor. So these are just two quick examples of infrastructure or PASA centers uh, that we've recently invested in for our community. The next area is a strategic focus on program and service delivery. 
Each se season, our Community Services Division, in partnership with a host of not-for-profit agencies, offers hundreds of programs, events, activities for our community. We look for program synergies and connections between sport, between recreation, social opportunities, arts, health, and wellness. And we know together that they contribute to active lifestyles, healthier communities, and an enhanced quality of life. One example that I'm particularly proud of is our participation in the Community Better Challenge, which is a national initiative offered by Participation Canada. We joined this initiative in 2019, and every June throughout the month, uh, we offer a series of activities, we offer education, and we offer inspiration, providing opportunities for our residents to find recreation and sport activities that they enjoy and to increase the number of people participating in physical activity. In 2022, Richmond was named BC's most active community, recognizing the over 9.7 million minutes of activity that our residents recorded. It also recognized the strategic and ongoing approach that we take in, to investing in the health and well being of our community. The final area is community involvement. And in all of our work, we take what we call a relationship-based approach to the delivery of our programs and services. And this means that each of our departments is committed to the engagement of our community in the strategy development, in decision-making, in developing new facilities and infrastructure, and to actually running the programs and services themselves. We really believe that by sharing decision-making with the community, that we harness their expertise and increase our capacity for the delivery of programs and services. These are a few quick examples of successes uh, that really serve Richmond well in, in our implementation of our Global Active City Initiative. But we know that with success all comes, also comes opportunity and challenges. And so I'm going to touch briefly on four areas that I think we can continue to focus on and improve on as we move forward in our global active city journey. The first, not surprisingly, is around pandemic and pandemic recovery. We know that the pandemic interrupted our focus on the implementation of key initiatives and actions in our PASA management system. The pandemic required us to be very operationally focused so that we could just continue to offer programs and services in the face of ever-changing health requirements. It's time to turn our attention back to our strategies and to reprioritize the actions. I also see a real opportunity for us to advocate at all levels of government from local to international on the important role that physical activity and sport played throughout the pandemic in ensuring the health and well being of our communities. The second area is our PASA, PASA dashboard. We've not made as much progress in measuring our outcomes as we would have liked. We are very skilled at measuring outputs related to our strategic initiatives and actions, but measuring of ongoing and meaningful outcomes seems to be more challenging for us and a real area for us to focus. The third area is to consider the broadening of our PASA Alliance. We have a very engaged and vibrant alliance and one that we're very proud of. But what we've learned from some of our global uh, partners or, or the other global cities is that they've really benefited by the, the involvement of both private businesses and post-secondary education institutions. And so these are other stakeholders that we'd like to explore and reach out to and see whether or not we can further expand and build on our PASA Alliance moving forward. The final area, marketing and communication. We have an opportunity to further leverage and promote the Global Active City brand. And this will become particularly important as more cities join the initiative and it gains broader recognition, it will become even more important. I hope that I've helped you to understand Richmond's approach to our Global Active City initiative. We have a clear vision we have a management system with clear goals and objectives. We have multiple and diverse PASA centers. We have a unique approach rooted in citizen engagement and participation. 
but we still have much work to do in ensuring that every person in Richmond is as active and participating in wellness opportunities as they can. We want every individual in Richmond to lead the healthiest life possible and ultimately to achieve our vision of being the most livable, appealing, livable and well-managed community in Canada. Thank you. Yes, that's perfect. So um, I know that uh, Elizabeth said to us that she will uh, look again uh, at the recorded session. So uh, to you, Elizabeth, thank you very much for the sending of this, uh, this video and, and your presentation. I think it was a great testimony of, um, of a pathway. Uh, we were connected with the team of, of Richmond starting in 2016. So now it's great to see after so many years how um, the, the active city and global active city approach evolves over the years. Um, now speaking about the second presentation, I'm happy and honored to uh, welcome Mary Corey, who is National Active Cities Officer, uh, working with Limerick Sports Partnerships, but uh, on behalf of uh, Sports Island also. Uh, and this presentation, uh, it, it's, it's great speaking about the global active city and more generally about active cities, because uh, it's uh, the connection between the national approach and what could happen locally with the different cities. So uh, welcome, Mary, and the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Michael, and thanks to Liverpool John Moores University, Evalio, and to PISA for inviting me to present today. Um, my short presentation will provide an overview of what the Active Cities Project is and how things are structured here in Ireland. How the need of the project was identified along with an overview of the key elements that are involved. And then what I'll do is I'll finish with providing an outline of some of the benefits and challenges that we have found to taking a national approach to active cities here in Ireland. The Active Cities Project is a Sport Ireland initiative and it's funded through dormant accounts. A requirement of this funding is that it must be used to support those who are economically, educationally, or socially disadvantaged, or people with a disability. So these are our target groups for the project itself. It is being delivered across the five largest cities um, in the Republic of Ireland, and it's being coordinated and facilitated by eight local sports partnerships. So the focus of the project is on enabling each city to become an active city. And it was great to sit in on um, Gethan's presentation this morning, outlining exactly what an active city needs to look like. So within the Republic of Ireland, there are 26 counties and Sport Ireland is the statutory authority who oversees the development of sport from participation level right through to high performance and elite level. So as part of their work, Sport Ireland fund, support and guide the work of the local sports partnership network. This involves 29 individual local sports partnerships working across the country. So there's one in each county, along with four in Dublin. Across Ireland, there are five large cities, ranging in population from about 50,000 to 1.1 million. And eight local sports partnerships, or LSPs as they're known, work across these five cities. And it is these who have been funded by Sport Ireland to deliver on the project. In terms of a bit of a background to the project, at an international level, we saw the development of the Global Action Plan for Physical Activity Framework, along with the introduction of the Global Active City Label. This framework and standard provide guidance and support to Sport Ireland, so we can learn from what's happening internationally. At the same time, I suppose at a national level, we have ongoing research into physical activity levels in Ireland through the Irish Sports Monitor, or ISM as it's known. 
along with the development of various national plans and policies. And I suppose all of these things together shape the work and direction taken by Sport Ireland. We know from broader research that high rates of physical inactivity are negatively impacting the health, economy, environment and community of our cities. And it was great to see the detail that was presented reminding us of this in this morning's presentations. In Ireland, only 42% of adults and 13% of children meet the recommended national physical activity guidelines, which is 30 minutes of moderate to intense activity, five days a week for adults and an hour every day for children. Whilst inactivity is the issue, the problem is the negative impact this is having on our society as a whole. Given over a third of the Irish population live across the five largest cities, there was a clear need identified for establishing a city-specific project seeking to make our cities more active places. So it was decided the Active Cities project would be created across the five largest cities in Ireland. So how is it structured? Following discussions between Sport Ireland and the eight local sports partnerships, Sport Ireland invited applications and based on these, it provided individual funding to each local sport partnership and is continuing to do so on an annual basis. The eight LSPs pooled funds to recruit a national active cities officer and also to assign an initial national marketing budget to develop the brand, a promotional video, and for, for a national launch. I was then recruited as National Active Cities Officer to work on behalf of the eight LSPs, and I'm based within their network, so I'm employed through the Limerick Sports Partnership. Each LSP then recruited or appointed a local Active Cities Officer to lead on the project in their area. And collectively, we developed the Active Cities brand and logo. The national logo, top right of your screen, included the color of each city in the icon. And this enabled the consistency in the localized versions with each area retaining its own color, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. Through um, engaging an external evaluation agency, Sport Ireland supported the eight local sports partnerships in establishing a clear vision and mission for the project. And also in creating a logic model on which the project could be evaluated on. The Active Cities framework identified clear objectives under four key pillars which enables each city to develop their localized action plans specific to the needs of their area. Working within their wider sports partnership teams, the local active cities officers look to identify gaps in provision and barriers to participation through the active people pillar. They seek to enhance the marketing and promotion of opportunities to ensure our message is reaching those we are looking to target. A central focus of their work is to work in partnership and is to collaborate with relevant organizations who directly and indirectly impact on physical activity levels. So through the active systems and the active environments pillars, the objective is really to broaden the conversation encouraging other organizations to take a more holistic view of physical activity. If we are to create active cities, we need to take a multi-sectoral approach to addressing the issues. This will require building on existing relationships, but also widening the network of organizations and stakeholders involved. So who needs to be involved? This is an example of all those who will need to be involved if we are to enable our cities in Ireland to become active cities. And there may, may be others specific to a city, hence the question mark box. 
There is a clear need for collaboration to ensure greater impact of efforts and resources and to increase the likelihood of sustainability that people get involved, get active, but then really sustain their participation. As you can see from the chart, the local sports partnerships are just one cog. Whilst the active cities officers are responsible for coordinating the project, they are only one facilitator really of many who need to be involved to make the project a success and our cities active. There are numerous benefits and challenges to taking a national approach in developing an active cities project. For the eight local sports partnerships, working collectively has provided a great opportunity to learn from each other and to collaborate on the development of a national framework. So in essence, they're not individually having to do it on their own. Although this is a national initiative, Given the structure of both the funding and the Active Cities Framework, each LSP has the flexibility to localise their action plans and budgets to meet the needs of their specific area. Also, having a national lead provides the opportunity to engage with other stakeholders at both a national and international level in support of the work that is being driven locally. It also provides a support and a sounding board to each local active cities officer as they look to progress the project and develop in their area. The local sports partnerships also have the option of pooling resources together. So in essence, being able to create greater buying power. And as this is a national project, I suppose another key benefit is there is, the, there is ongoing evaluation taking place looking at both process and outcomes across the five cities. And this is funded separately by Sport Ireland. So this isn't coming at a separate cost to the local sports partnerships. But with any project, there are challenges. And I suppose the, re the recruitment of active cities officers has been slow across the network, primarily because five of the eight local sports partnerships are based within their local authority structures. So they're based within their municipality structures and recruitment is much, much slower in these organizations. This has hindered the progress to date across these areas. A second challenge has been capital funding. 50% of all funds received in year one were capital funds, but given staff had yet to be recruited, and relationships built, it was much more challenging to spin down these budgets. As national lead, it can be challenging to gain group consensus with eight individual organizations. Each has its own board, staff, priorities, and identity. And so I suppose open and transparent communication continues to be essential. Lastly, I suppose in terms of challenges, and it was highlighted um, in, in this morning's presentation by the WHO in particular, um, while the Irish Sports Monitor provides us here in Ireland with national baseline data, we currently do not have any city-specific baseline data on physical activity levels. And this currently hinders our ability to effectively evidence impact. But we're continuing to work with the Sport Ireland Research Unit to overcome this. And it's great to see that the developments that are taking place internationally in terms of putting a spotlight on it by the WHO in terms of the importance of this in being able to evidence the impact um, that, is, that is taking place. But I suppose everything takes time. And that's something that I've had to learn in my role over the last 18 months in particular. And um, despite the challenges, the project is progressing and it has great potential. For those of you who would like any additional information, please feel free to contact me directly or visit um, our webpage. And um, I will leave you now with a short promotional clip used as part of our national launch. The city is your place to get active in. It's just about getting out, running, walking, cycling, swimming. We have parks, we have walkways. There's so much in here in our city now. People are actually a lot more productive if they're after any type of exercise.
all the worries of the day just disappear. I do it because it's fun. For being active, it's connection, basically. One word, it's a community. Do it for fun, your health, your family. Do it for yourself. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, as I said before, we have the, the chance to have this afternoon uh, a testimony from, uh, from um, Richmond in Canada, so um, a specific approach. Here we have some uh, insights from Mary speaking about a national approach. But what I like in your presentation is really that uh, it's still a local approach and to consider the speci specificities and the uh, uh, and the needs of the local uh, governments and, and local communities, that's very important. So we will come back at the end of, of the session with some, <clears throat> some questions about that. So now for, for the next intervention presentation, uh, I will introduce to you Mr. Jaideep Sarkar uh, from the city of Bokaro uh, in India. Uh, we had the opportunity to start working together end of 2019 and the city of Bocaro joined the Active Wellbeing Initiative Network uh, beginning of 2020. So now uh, I'm happy to work uh, more than three years with you, Jaideep. So you will share some information and uh, your experience about developing a global active city approach in a, a quite different context as it's the case in Europe or some other countries. Um, so, uh, Jaidi, perhaps I'll let you start, and when you want me to share the first uh, slide, don't, don't hesitate to ask me. The floor is yours, Jaidi. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And first of all, I am grateful to the Liverpool John Moore University, the organizers, Tafisa, Ivalu. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly, uh, Jaidi. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, my voice is uh, from a different angle, you can say, uh, from a, a developing country with uh, one of the huge populated country, most youth populated country, India. So, the, uh, whatever the good practices like this Global Active City Mission is going on across the world, it is important to give emphasis to this part of the world because people are more simple formula. So uh, let me start first. Um, Bokaro is a planned city in the state of Jharkhand in India. Jharkhand state is one of the richest in mines and minerals. So Bokaro steel city is a peculiar city which is owned by a company which is the largest steel making company of the country that is Steel Authority of India Limited, sale rather you can say sale. And we have eight integrated steel plants across the country. So uh, it has a population of 6,52,000 people as on record, maybe more. And the sex ratio is 889 female per thousand male. These are the basic ideas. And uh, uh, we are at the moment, we are the candidate city and we are passing through uh, a very crucial phase of auditing and all these things perhaps uh, the, as per the norms of global active city. So uh, we entered in this program in 20, 20, rather 2019, we have started in the month of December. And in 2020, the Global Active City Program was launched in India at Bokaro, uh, which was, I am happy to say, immediately, it was incorporated by the one of the IOC's important wings, that is CIPC, that is International Periodic Kubernetes Committee. Uh, since uh, let me tell you that uh, I am a board member, a national board member of uh, this uh, Indian Pierre de Coubertin Committee, which is a unit of the world body. 
and uh, uh, a very strong pillar of IOC. So uh, rather I can say uh, long back in the year of 2018, uh, I was just watching the periodicals of uh, International Olympic Committee. Just I observed that there is a program of global active city because I am a professional sports person. I am an Asian silver medalist in volleyball. So always the part of uh, sports and other things uh, in India rather in the world, it has a peculiar mentality that the sports is only for winning and losing and uh, the competitions, all these things. So uh, I had a plan, how can I uh, serve the society and the community through sports? So I got the, uh, this opportunity, this golden opportunity uh, to, 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 flourish, to, to flourish my country uh, through sports, to make the people healthy, happy, and spirited, rather champion also. So uh, in the month of February and onwards, March, April to August, we have conducted a series of programs. So you can see in the, uh, in the other slide, uh, Michael, please uh, show the other slide, the segment. Yes, this slide, the, the first one at the top, you can see the uh, deputy commissioner, the then deputy commissioner, Mr. Mukesh Kumar with me. Uh, he was the main uh, person who motivated, rather we both motivated each and other to, to, to give a strong desire to get involved in this program. And that, then after that, in the month of February, uh, you can see in the bottom, a mega health camp was organized at Bokaro for the elderly people above the age of 60 years. So all these activities, then we have launched a, a program of, uh, uh, you can say the procession in every Sunday uh, morning after the inauguration of our program in January 2020. So at that time, the total scenario was monitored and controlled by the district administration, rather you can say the government. But after the transfer of Mr. Mukesh Kumar as the deputy commissioner, the second man as a deputy commissioner came, uh, he told me that these bureaucratic posts were transferable and this good program must sustain. And luckily, the owner of the city is not the district administration, rather our company that is Steel Authority of India Limited. This is a, a strategical converse uh, we made. I discussed the matter with so many people and how to make this program sustainable. So that is very important part. Immediately after getting the positive nod from the uh, district administration to our uh, Bukaro Steel Management. Our dynamic director in charge, Mr. Amarendu Prakas, he was very keen, he is very keen and he will be very keen in sports. He called me and he showed that uh, keen interest to go ahead in this program and uh, gradually we started doing so many activities. We launched a, a mega um, you can see, show the second slide, Michael, please. In that, you can see. Second slide, yes. Uh, on the uh, foundation day of Steel Authority of India Limited in 2021, uh, a series of uh, programs were launched. That means uh, uh, the first program was the creation of 30 playgrounds in the city. Then uh, the creation of sports centers. Earlier, uh, we were having only one football academy at Bokaro uh, of a national level. After this uh, launching, uh, basketball, volleyball, archery, cricket, these four centers were created uh, at Bokaro uh, with uh, within this umbrella of global active city. Then we have interacted, started interacting with the schools and the other stakeholders of uh, this city. So uh, you can see in the top right, 
uh, the interaction program with the uh, global authorities uh, of uh, with Ibalio, then we managed to collaborate with the global uh, authorities like the uh, Leipzig University of Germany because it has a, has a very good contribution to India. Uh, the Leipzig University Germany has masterminded the Indian sports training method since 1961. And uh, we are having the headquarter of this that university, the national uh, body in India is at our Bukaro Steel City. So it is a, our opportunity that we can collaborate, but due to COVID, this program was not uh, uh, fulfilled despite our willingness. Then in uh, between April to August, 2021, uh, there was a, a virtual, uh, rather I can say, a, a survey by the Liverpool John Moore University was done. And uh, uh, rather I got the communication from LJMU and according to uh, our position at that time, we have reverted back that uh, we are at this stage and we, are start we have started doing all these uh, activities. But due to the uh, impact of COVID, most of this uh, period was uh, wasted. And the, in the year 2021, when our Steel Authority of India Limited took over, rather uh, we can say adopted this program, uh, again, uh, the acceleration was more. And uh, at this moment, we can say that we have uh, uh, made 20 playgrounds already completed, open gyms in city and peripheral areas, uh, especially sponsoring the Special Olympic Mission. Uh, we have uh, sponsored this mission for the Special Olympic at Berlin, Germany, 2022-23. So that is one of the important part. Then uh, we have recently started organizing citizen-based uh, sports and physical activity programs like uh, uh, cycling to glory, uh, like uh, yoga for citizen. You can see all this uh, photo, uh, in these photographs, you can see and you have to make oh, which one is, uh, the first one is the launching program. Second one is uh, the interaction with the Indian Olympic Association where Michael was there. I was the moderator at the time. And the third one is the interaction uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, Evalio then uh, launching of the playground, then the center middle one is the interaction with the schools. We have so far interacted uh, more than 10 schools. Uh, and uh, we have covered, I can say, uh, if you cal calculate in every school, at least 3000 students are there. So we have covered more than 30,000 students at, in our own city. Then and there is a cycling program, then a yoga program, and a very attractive program, which was launched in 27th November uh, 2022, and is a happy street program. It is a, it is a unique program where uh, all the citizens, they can come and they play, they do dance, they sing, uh, whatever they like. Uh, and it was also uh, inaugurated by our director in charge. Then uh, two days before, we have conducted a, a marathon, a half marathon at our own city, which was uh, one of the very uh, important one because near about 5,000 uh, athletes and people, they participated in that program. So uh, these are in a nutshell, we can say, we are moving ahead. And apart from that, during the uh, period of COVID, we have from our company, our steel plant, we have supplied oxygen to the entire country. That is one of very important part. So uh, uh, all these uh, things you can see, uh, we are moving ahead and we are regularly interacting, collaborating with the national organizations, other stakeholders, the international bodies. And uh, uh, right now we are passing through a phase uh, of audit uh, and uh, I think uh, the way uh, we are moving and uh, uh, things are going on, so we can uh, be able to get that uh, uh, accreditation uh, within uh, a few months. Uh, and uh, importantly, 
the management of Bukharo Steel and the Steel Authority of India Limited. They are very keen in this program and the future plannings are such that I met the uh, uh, steel secretary, that means you can say the government of India steel uh, uh, secretariat, and he is also very keen in this program. So he's, he uh, they told me that they will support in this uh, salubrious program to go ahead because there are uh, we are having so many uh, departments also. So in the month of May 2021, uh, our director in charge made one committee uh, that consists of doctors, engineers, the uh, town administrators, sports persons, physiotherapists, even the retired sports persons. They are now getting engaged in this mission to shoulder this program. The retired sports persons having good experience in uh, sports and all these things yoga and other things, physical activities, they are getting involved in this program. So in a nutshell, we can say that from this part of the world, and apart from that, uh, uh, we tried with the support of Evalio, we have also tried our level best to incorporate the neighboring countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. It is not a part that only one city to be uh, flourished, but rather, all this part, this is the most populated, densely populated part of the world. So uh, again, I am saying that uh, all the goodwill missions or these good practices must come to this part to flourish the world. Uh, rather, we can say by uh, within a couple of months, India will overtake China by 2023. As I understand, I heard today, I learned today through Google. So uh, this is a very, and issues are peculiar. We are having so many issues, multidimensional issues and uh, challenges, rather we can say challenges are opportunities. So I am directly, uh, regularly in uh, contact you know, with uh, Michael and also to John recently, we developed a very good relation so that we can go ahead and uh, we are trying our level best to establish uh, Bukaro as a model city so that other cities of India, they can uh, see how we are going ahead. Uh, because uh, India uh, and- so, so, Sorry, to, uh, sorry to interrupt, Ajib, sorry to interrupt, just to know that it's uh, almost the end of the session, so- Okay, 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 thank you. Thank you, thank you very yeah, much. I'm also completing, it is all okay. So these are the things. Okay, so okay, thank you very much, Jaidip. Thank you, uh, thank you. It was great to have some uh, information about what happened the last two years uh, in, in your context. Um, so now um, it's the time for, for questions and answers. So I had some from um, the, the panelists. Uh, I will try also to, to see if there's other questions. So perhaps um, I can start um, with uh, Mary Corey. Um, let me open. Okay, so it's a question from um, someone from Liverpool John Moores University. So Mary, can you just uh, share a bit more information um, about the relationship between the national approach and the city specific approach. Uh, is it the same time scale for all cities or not necessarily? I, I think when I started my role, I thought it would be the same time scale for all of the cities, but I learned very quickly that it, it isn't and it wouldn't work even if it did because the needs of the cities vary from city to city. Um, I think when the project commenced, I suppose one of the key things to recognize was that the, the local sports partnerships are already doing tremendous work under the active people pillar and under the active societies pillar. And I suppose it was it's really about building on that existing work and looking to enhance that. And I suppose depending on what level of work and what level of progress had been made by the local sports partnerships in each area to date, then impacted on how the active cities officers, once they were recruited, would identify the gaps and, um, you know, in terms of the gaps of in current provision or, or the challenges. I think where the area of work that 
I suppose is is expanding out on on the on the remit of, of what the local sports partnerships do is in the area of the active environments and the active systems. So it's really looking to have uh, to have an impact at that level, but also I suppose to we want to you know have the discussions with organisations, whether it be local authority units like urban planning, transport operations, housing, so that you know they have that understanding of where physical activity sits. So at the minute, sometimes it's it's not very obvious to them that physical activity is something that they need to consider. So I suppose that's a key part of the work. In terms of the timescales, it completely varies simply because each of them, each area is confined, or I suppose confined in terms of funding applications and in terms of reporting back on those. But each, because it's individual funding applications, they're able to, I suppose, apply for what the need is for their area. So they keep in mind what the national framework is and in basically they're their broader objectives, but then they're able to basically localize it. So I suppose there, there aren't timescales, but I suppose it's, it's all about making progress from where, we, where we're at in each area and each area is at a different time point. So I suppose the benefit from that is as a group, we're able to learn from what's happening in each area as things develop. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. And um, I have also one or two questions for, for, for Jaidip, but perhaps because we will speak about that in the, in the next session uh, very shortly, uh, Mary, because it's, we have five, five minutes uh, until the end of, of the session, but can you share um, some words about how you were able to work on the topic of uh, monitoring and measurement because of course with the experience we know that it's a, it's a great issue for almost all cities um so uh, i know that you were able to work on a on a logic model so perhaps can you share some words about what you were able to to manage to support the cities in this pathway yeah, so the so the logic model was created by Sport Ireland, the eight LSPs, and the external evaluation agency. And within that, it identified that the, one of the key issues is the 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 level, the the low level of of adults and children meeting the physical activity guidelines. Um, I suppose what what it is uh, highlighted is that we don't have the baseline data for that city specific. So that is hindering. So we have we have gotten we're working with the Sport Ireland Research Unit um, and looking at other avenues of how that information can be gathered. And I think there is now a real recognition um, within Sport Ireland that that information does need to be gathered, particularly if we want to make real progress with moving towards certification around global active city or actually just being able to evidence the impact. Because when you bring a lot of stakeholders around the table, they want to know, they want to visibly be able to see what is the impact of what we're doing. And without the data, it's obviously very hard to do that. So that's very much a work in progress at the moment. Thank you very much, Mary. And perhaps what I have to, to say also, it's, uh, it's great how you were able to link with the four pillars of the WHO Global Action Plan on Physical Activity that has been presented this morning uh, by Fiona Boll. And it became, uh, as you've said in your presentation, uh, a way to structure also the logic model and the overall uh, framework. So uh, very, very interesting to see the interactions between international policies, national approach and city specific approach. Uh, thank, thanks again, Mary. Uh, perhaps a question for you, Jaidip, because yes. as you, met, you, you mentioned, um, it's, um, it's an original and specific context uh, with the relationship between public authorities of the municipality and also the, the authorities of the, um, the company. Um, so just to, to uh, add information about that, can you also explain uh, the, um, the type of uh, areas uh, that have to be supported by the, by the company, speaking about the public issues, so it could be education, health, uh, of course, sports, uh, is it the, the, the same level or some of them are just managed by the municipality without the company? Can you just add some explanation? Okay, okay. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, here in India, there are so many types of cities. One is our type, that is cities owned by some public sectors. Okay, now most of the cities, or you can say all 
almost all the cities they are governed by the state governments or the local administration or municipalities you can say but there are so many cities like bokaro we are having another six or seven cities steel cities there are oil cities there are power cities so uh, the power cities you can say they generate the power for the country the oil cities you can say that indian oil corporation cities they are based on the public sectors like ours we are totally self dependence in terms of the well being of the citizen in terms of health education or anything you can say and the working culture is more polished in our sector than in the governance or municipality and secondly most important what i experience uh, and i have shared also along back with you that within one year or two year the head of the municipality changes so what happens every time you have to knock the deputy commissioner to the same thing whether he will like it or not like it depends more or less it is better to uh, for the sustainability of this program this is a unique program so for the better sustainability of the program the city owner that means in our case our managing director or director in charge right now mr amarendu prakash he because he is very keen so all the things are within him even protocol wise he is above the deputy commissioner for the city because it is a central government public uh, public sector and he reports when during his joining to our steel plant he reports to the governor not to the chief minister and the deputy commissioner if protocol wise his boss is the chief minister so we are a national integrated company so our strength is more and we are a money making company a very good now we are in a profit Uh, mode so we have we are supplying the rails for the indian railway the one of the biggest railways in india we are okay. supporting the rocket bases we are supporting the rocket launchers also so that is one part the budgeting the funding is very important so yeah, from that angle we are sufficient self sufficient jai deep Th thank you very much because that's very interesting because of course uh, with the last year's uh, experiences uh, we learned that uh it could be a model uh to 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 develop uh, uh, an active city approach uh but with the collaboration with the municipal municipality departments and local agencies or other type of organization that can uh lead the development of the project so it's not necessarily the city alone or the city hall alone but it could be in collaboration with different type of, of organization so um, very useful yes yes definitely definitely yeah so yeah. that's you, now you see, michael uh, just uh, one yeah. minute yeah just you see the collaboration in the marathon the deputy commissioner and the superintendent and police they ran the marathon so we okay. are very much yeah. uh, inclusive <laughs> it is not that's like a, everybody is fighting very and uh, <laughs> that is the thing <laughs> okay thank you very much jadeep it was great to have your your testimony today thank you also mary and again uh, elizabeth so now that's the end of the third session uh and uh, i give you the floor again keys for for the next and uh, many thanks to you all uh, for listening thanks uh, thank you very much michael and and to to all the speakers um i think that's a, a fairly uh, fairly broad international coverage from bc canada all the way across to uh, to india and i think it's fantastic to see the different places and the different challenges uh, not least to which what mary was talking about in terms of you know city based versus uh, country based initiatives and and we can all learn uh, from from the different approaches that people take um but i am going to move straight on to to gate on who's going to uh, chair the, the the final interactive session of the day so gate on the floor is yours thank you keith thank you michael and thank you to also the, the three previous speakers for providing these very inspiring stories that show 
uh, how it's possible to do something at your level. And I hope we've inspired many people around the room today to start their own strategy for active cities. Now we are going to get started with this session on how actually we can develop active cities. What are the first steps? What are the tools? And for this, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Lynn Body from Liverpool John Moores University, as well as Clara Gauthier for Sport and Citizenship, and uh, Fozzie Ekehard Moritz from Innovations Manufacturer, who will be presenting uh, some of their uh, method and details. So, <clears throat> Lynn Body, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Can everybody see my slides and hear okay? Perfect. Thanks for that. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to go through a very rapid um, talk about the importance of evidence and evaluation, evidence-based practice. And this, this is kind of based on the work that we've done so far in Liverpool, but also with our other partner cities around the world. So I'm just going to quickly go through evidence-based practice, evaluation and insight. Um, some kind of brief discussion about what to measure, and then give you some examples of some work that we've done um, here in Liverpool, and move on to how universities can support evidence-based practice around the world and how people can work with their local institutions to help develop evidence-based practice. So why do we um, need to engage in evidence-based practice? Why, why, why would, would we be interested in this? Well, evidence-based practice helps us to understand the current situation. So what's going on in our cities? What is the current state of play? It helps us to inform, inform policy. It helps us to make some informed decisions around resourcing and resource allocation. We can demonstrate the effectiveness and the impact of our initiatives, our policy changes, our projects. We can monitor changes on a population level to see what's going on and to be able to detect changes quite quickly. And it also provides us with the evidence to apply for funding, to apply for support, to develop infrastructure projects and initiatives. And I think a few of our speakers today have already kind of alluded to this um, as they've gone through their talks. So we talk about um, evidence-based practice and is, there's different levels of this. And one level or one activity that, that we typically would engage in and cities often engage in is insight. And this is kind of activity that's maybe not as rigorous or robust or um, as large in terms of the workload as, as full scale evaluation, but it's really useful to help plan what cities can do and to plan what we can do. Helps us know what our strategy and our vision is and helps us know our local context. We can learn things about our populations. We can learn things about barrier, barriers, mediators and enablers for promotion of physical activity. Insight also can help us interact with our key stakeholders, which informs the planning phases of um, policy, of projects, of interventions. And it can also allow us to be inventive and to help us be more creative when we're planning what to do. So insight is very useful when we're in the planning stages of initiatives and projects and policies. Evaluation, on the other hand, is a little bit more in depth and it examines what we've done, what people have done, what projects have done. And there's a lot of different reasons why we should evaluate projects. We can find out whether it worked, which is quite a handy thing. We can find out why it worked, we can find out what went wrong, who it worked for, what improvements we can make, what went well, was it cost effective? We can cover things like the process um, evaluation. So did we reach our targets? Did the project run as we thought it would run and we hoped it would run? Is it sustainable, which is a really important um, issue to, to understand. We can also look at the effectiveness. So that's what, what most people think of when we think of evaluation. Did it work? Did we change the outcomes or the behaviors that we were hoping to change? What didn't work? What didn't work? Did it work better for some groups than others? Did we recruit the people that we were hoping to be, uh, be recruiting and were effects maintained? And are the projects maintained long-term? So evaluation can give us the rationale for future decision-making and really understand whether what we've been doing works and who it works for, and if anyone is being left behind, if we're seeing any inequalities in what we're doing. So I think one of the things that we get asked a lot as a university with our partner city in Liverpool, with other partner cities that are involved in the Global Active City Programme and beyond is, 
okay, what do we measure? What do we need to capture? What data is important to us? And how can we go about measuring this? So you can break this down into primary outcomes and secondary outcomes. So the primary outcomes are what we really need to understand. What are our key performance indicators? What is it that we're trying to change? So typically in physical activity programs, the primary outcomes are changes in physical activity behaviors, changes in sedentary behaviors, or participation. So numbers of people attending events, numbers of people attending clubs or initiatives each week, engaging in sports, all those types of things. So they're typically the primary outcomes, but there are considerations around that. So at what level are we wanting to measure these things? Are we looking at population level um, estimates of how active our cities are and how active our each population within that city. So for example, our children and young people, our working age adults, our older adults, is that what we're looking for? Or are we looking at specific groups? So for example, three to five year old school children or our 55 to 65 year old working adults? Or are we looking very specifically at the individual level and whether things are changing for individuals um, in terms of health status, in terms of engagement with activity, all those types of things. We then have our secondary outcomes. And these are the complementary variables or data that we're interested in that can help us understand the broad impact of any changes or help us understand um, changes that we're interested in that might not be quite the primary outcome, but might be changed as a result of an improvement in physical activity or a reduction in central behavior. So we might measure certain health outcomes or certain health markers. We might look at the cost effectiveness of programs and do some economic analysis. We also might look at process evaluation variables. So things like I mentioned before, who did the initiative target? Did they enjoy it? Did it work for some people better, better than others? Did it miss out certain organizations or populations? And again, we can look at secondary outcomes in specific subsamples or subgroups and using different me methods. So typically, if we were running a really large scale population level measurement of physical activity, we might focus on a subgroup and rather than just use a survey with them, we might start looking at other measures that we measure more directly. So they might wear activity monitors or we might do some fitness assessments or we might do some qualitative work with them to understand in a bit more depth what's going on. So that leads me on to the methods and tools. And again, this is something that we get asked about a lot. And physical activity is notoriously difficult to measure, unfortunately, because it's a behavior. Funders like us to put numbers on this behavior, but it's also really important to understand what contributes to physical activity and, and the rich in-depth information that we can gain from individuals. So we need to ma match our tools or our methods to the outcomes. So what is our primary outcome? If our primary outcome is we want to see all children in a particular school reaching 60 minutes every day of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, we might need to, to give every child in that school an activity monitor. Whereas if we're looking at have we in, in general changed positively a population's physical activity levels, we might use a survey that is only made up of a few questions. So the methods that we use really needs to match the outcomes. So we might use surveys or questionnaires. We might use devices to measure physical activity. We might conduct health checks to measure things like diabetes risk, cholesterol, or body mass index and things like that. But then we might use some qualitative and creative approaches so that we can hear the voices of people that are involved in our programs and our work. We might use simple metrics like attendances. So for example, in Liverpool, we might look at the number of people that go to lifestyle centers or the number of people that attend a mass participation event. <clears throat> in terms of health outcomes, we might look at hospital statistics. We might look at the number of disease events and things like that. We don't always need to go and collect new data. There are existing data sets there that we can use and different municipalities have different data available that is already there and, and can be used as part of an evaluation. Now, when I'm talking about this, a lot of people will be thinking, well, there's a lot to consider there. And, and that's true. 
we need to think about who we're working with, the time and resources available, the tools that are available, the costs of using certain things, the infrastructure available to do evaluation and to collect evidence, and fundamentally, who is going to do this? Have we got a spare pair of hands that can go and collect all this data? And that's where partnership working can be really beneficial. So I just want to go through a couple of slides where we're focusing on some of the work we've done in Liverpool and with some of our partner cities, um, just to give a little bit of context and some examples. So in Liverpool, the original Liverpool Active City model that was created back in 2005 was underpinned by evaluation evidence from members of the Physical Activity Exchange, but also we, we helped in evaluating some of those projects. So the evidence base was there saying we need projects in these areas and some of our projects then evaluated some of the initiatives put in place by the active city uh, partnership and network to say okay these are working well these maybe aren't working well this is how we can improve this is what's going on and that partnership approach is a real feature of the active city strategy and now the global active city program so one example that some of you might have seen before was the SportsLinks project. This project dated back to 1998, and it was a large scale health and fitness program for children. We found lots of things over the years. So we found things like declining fitness, increases in childhood obesity and overweight. We've found some interesting patterns in sedentary behavior and changes in food intake and hot spots of really positive food intake and food intake that we would like to try and improve. So what changed as a result of this, this fed into chambers, this fed into the council and to the health authorities and provided the evidence to inform needs assessments, to inform policy, to inform targeting of resources and targeting of interventions. So we had this reciprocal relationship where we generated evidence, we provided it to the council, they put something in place, we evaluated that again, we worked together to continually develop this evidence-based practice approach. And we're still trying to work on it and evolve it today. Another evaluation example was for the smoke-free smoke, smoke sports program, sorry. And this was a sport for health initiative. I'm not going to go into detail, but what I want to show you about this evaluation is that the team involved used what we, what's called an evaluation framework. And they used the re-aim framework. And this is a really useful tool to help projects know what to evaluate and how to get the evidence needed and the information needed to really evolve and continue to evolve programs. So the REM framework is broken into reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. And by working through each of these components and collecting the relevant data, it allows a more comprehensive understanding of what works, what doesn't work, and what we could do in the future. I could spend an hour talking about REAIM, and I'm sure I probably have done to some of you before, but it's something that's really useful. And if people are interested in evaluation, it's worth looking up the REAIM framework and visiting the website where there's loads of resources and loads of examples. Okay, so on to the final sort of area I wanted to cover today, and that's how universities can work with cities and how we can support partner cities with evidence and evaluation. So what can we do as academic partners? So we can help with the generation of key questions. Most universities and most um, departments that are working in public health or physical activity or sport and exercise science are research active and they're working at that generation of new knowledge forefront. So can help with generating those questions that, that would be helpful to answer. We can also help with some evaluation expertise. So we can help with knowing or advising or discussing what to measure. What are the key outcomes that could be useful to measure and might actually change? And how to measure these? In our general research and our research projects, we have to measure outcomes all the time. So we've got experience in measuring a range of behaviors using a range of different techniques. So we can help advise on how to measure, what to measure, and also advise on the tools and skills for evaluation and evidence-based practice. We can help 
train people, we can help develop researchers and the workforce, we can work in partnership, we can apply for funding together to create the resource to do evaluation. We are a resource in ourselves. Universities have thousands of students, most of whom need to do research or are looking for placements or are being trained to go into the workforce. So universities have a lot of resources in the form of their excellent students that are engaged and are motivated to work in this area. So partnering up can also bring a significant volunteering resource and a resource of people who really want to develop skills and expertise in this area and work in the real world. We work with a lot of different people. All universities are linked into lots of different organizations and settings and partners and stakeholders. So we can help link partners together and develop new partnerships. And we can develop the working practices that, that we are hoping to develop within the Global Access City um, alliances. We can help with patient and public engagement in research and knowledge transfer. Part of our job is to be that knowledge transfer um, conduit. We are trying to spread the word, to, in, to enhance knowledge and to share our knowledge and practice with the world. So we can help in doing that. We can help in disseminating information. So spreading the message is something that we we have to do and something that we enjoy doing as academic institutions. Some examples from, from our specific group is that we've worked with partner cities through workshops to help develop evidence-based practice, to help um, answer key questions and to help put infrastructure together and train people to be able to go back and do specific uh, projects of work or learn more about evaluating and measurement, measuring. And we've hosted a couple of these workshops uh, over the over the previous years before COVID. And it's something that we would look to do again. And we applied for funding to do that. And we were able to bring our partners to Liverpool for study visits and to do some work. And that's the sort of activity the universities can do locally and obviously internationally as well, if we can be successful in the funding applications. Okay, so I'm just going to sum up here. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm sorry, I've gone through this quite quickly, but I'm conscious that We've got time at the end to answer questions and I'm more than happy to answer questions as we go through. So in summary, evidence-based practice is really important for informing decision-making. It allows us to see what works and for who and what could work better. It helps us understand where to invest and what to continue to invest in and to provide that supporting information to go and seek funding and get more support from funders to do what we want to do in terms of promoting physical activity and sport for all. There are multiple levels and multiple methods of generating the evidence, and these should be selected based on the key performance indicators, the level of detail needed, and the resources available. It's got to be feasible, it's got to be practical. An active university within an active city can help to facilitate evidence-based practice and action. We can help provide training and development. We can pr provide that volunteer resource through our, our, our workforce, through our students that are really enthusiastic in these areas. And we can add to space and facility resource as well, if given that we have spaces and structures wherever our campuses are. Thank you for your time and I look forward to, to answering your questions later this afternoon. Thank you so much, Lynn, for, for sharing uh, the work that you've been doing with Liverpool John Mills University and really looking in detail at how the framework of monitoring and evaluation can look like. And I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you later. Please, I remind all of the participants, feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A and we will address them at the end of this session. Now Thank for you. our next presentation, it is my pleasure to welcome Clara Gauthier from Sport and Citizenship um, to also present about uh, the matrix for active cities. Clara, the floor is yours. Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone. And so I'm Clara Gauthier from Sport and Citizenship, a European think tank based in uh, Brussels. I am delighted to, to be with you today discussing the, the concept of active cities. So thank you for, for inviting me. Uh, this is an important subject within our, our organization. 
so throughout my presentation, I will present uh, the Pact uh, Plus project. One of the projects both citizenship is uh, currently uh, leading, but I will start um, presenting sport and citizenship uh, in a few uh, words. So, um, a think tank, the European think tank based in Brussels, created uh, 15 years uh, ago, and our main role is to advocate for the integration of sport and physical activity as a cross-cutting tool for public policy in many different domains, health, social cohesion, gender equality, uh, the fight against all forms of discrimination, diplomacy, uh, etc. So, we produce a comprehensive reflection on these uh, challenges by uniting more than three, uh, 300 experts within a scientific committee and thematic uh, network. And at Sport Incentive, we act to make sport a lever for social uh, innovation. So we reflect on the social political issue related to, to sport. And our, our main goal is to participate in the construction process of policy both at national and European level in the area of sport um, related to health, education, citizen, all the different domains I just uh, mentioned. And our guiding principle is to take sport out of sport and go beyond this uh, unique prism of uh, competition. Uh, so yeah, as I just mentioned, we are we are currently uh, leading several different uh, European projects, uh, and one of those are the the Pact project uh, for the promotion of physical activities uh, at the local level. So I will give you elements of context to explain to you what the the Pact Plus project is. Uh, so after running. The first version of this project, the PACT project for three years and contributing to the active city um, concept. Uh, Asington have been selected by the European Commission to continue uh, this work with the PACT Plus project, so the second version of this project. Uh, and this project was launched uh, last June uh, and once again supported by the, the European Plus uh, Sport program. Uh, so for the first version of this project, the, the PACT project, so the, 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 the foundation of this um, beautiful uh, project. Uh, so over a period of 36 months, uh, this project has elaborated several uh, goals in order to develop active cities uh, in Europe. So we have started first to realize a large studies uh, and the, all the data extracted from the, the PACT project in a, 2018 uh, show a roaring uh, triptych that you, you may uh, know that. Um, so the data shows that while uh, 210 million Europeans are physically inactive, uh, representative a minimal annual cost of 80 billion euros, the study also uh, established that 66 percent of local European decision makers are unaware of this uh, roaring situation. So based on this uh, observation, we developed and created an interactive uh, matrix for every municipality to develop a customized active city action plan to transform um, itself into uh, an active city. Uh, so I, I, I will uh, explain more in detail in my presentation what the, the matrix for change is, but just a few words regarding the different objectives of the, of the PAD project. So this project is built around three uh, main objectives. So the first one is to take stock of cities improvement and the overall context. We already mentioned it during uh, this conference, but mainly after the, the COVID crisis. Uh, the, the second uh, objective is to unlock cities' potential to, to champion physical activities through four pilot interventions. Uh, we are working with different experts within our project, but also uh, with four European cities. And at the end of the project, we're going to uh, try to measure the impact of the program implementing to strengthen advocacy for physical activity and active cities policy. So yeah, just to sum up, the, the, the PACT Plus project uh, will answer the overall objective uh, of, of encouraging participation in sport and physical activities. Uh, the PACT Plus project will intend to respond to municipal uh, need. And we start from the assumption that 
physical activities should be made available in the place where we live, learn, work, uh, and play on a, on a daily basis. So basically the, the place we spend the most time, so school, work, transport, and where city leaders and planners must invest uh, more energy uh, on. So he, yeah, in order to, to intend this objective, uh, we, will, we, we will be relying on the, this tool, the Matrix for Change, uh, which is an innovative tool developed by Asington and the different partners of the PACT uh, project. So the, the Matrix for Change is by far the most uh, ambitious deliverable of the, of the project. The first version of this tool was uh, already conceptualized during the first version of the, of the project uh, between 2018 and 2021. Uh, and with the Pact Plus project, so the second version, we are we are in process of updating this uh, this tool. Um, I will try to show you a small video uh, which explains uh, more in detail what the, the matrix for change is. <laughs> To, 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 to up on that, so this uh, this matrix for for change, so this uh, tool was created to uh, to assist and guide local authority who are curious about starting their journey to to become an active city, uh, but but who are not sure how to to get uh, started. So th this uh, online tool will help. A municipality to develop a customized active city action plan to transform itself into um, an active city, or at least to, to try to, to develop some, some policy to become a, a more active city. So uh, this uh, tool is um, an easy to use checkbox uh, online matrix, uh, which invites municipalities to assess, to assess themselves against proven and successful elements of action, identify which action uh, which element are relevant and at the end ultimately uh, build their own uh, active city approach. Uh, so when you, you're using the, this online tool, tools, the results are immediately present as a mind map uh, that summarizes the, the customized action plan for direct action. Um, it's a really uh, user-friendly uh, online tool because, for example, it's possible to uh, complete the matrix in several times. Data are automatically saved online as you use uh, this uh, tool on the same uh, devices, so, for example, on the same uh, computer. Uh, so here is an example uh, of what the, this tool uh, looks like. So uh, the PACT project has identified, as I mentioned, a four action uh, setting. Uh, where the most effective action can be targeting. So active cities, active workplace, active mobility, and uh, active schools. So those settings correspond, as I mentioned, to the place where citizens spend, spend most of their uh, daily lives um, and can easily be reached. So each uh, different uh, active settings include an action uh, plan module, which makes uh, up to customize the, the active city action uh, plane. Um, and most of all, this uh, online tool provides also a large number of ideas, uh, solutions, quick wins, uh, share also different good practices that can inspire other cities to, to implement uh, at a local uh, level. So we try to, to make this, um, this tool uh, as simple uh, as possible. 
uh, and the, the results are directly uh, accessible and uh, can help uh, a municipality to, to start uh, the, the active city uh, journey. So I, I'm going to be uh, short on, on this, but uh, I can answer a question later on if needed. But as I mentioned, we have four different Items so yeah, active city, active place, mobility, and, and school. So all the different municipality can navigate between uh, those different items, uh, and all the different items uh, are uh, divided in five uh, subtitles. So uh, I will recommend uh, the, the person who are interested to, to navigate throughout all the different uh, items to, to discover them. Uh, we also a lot of different resources and some important information, example, advices uh, for municipality based on uh, some case study with the city we, we worked with during the with the, the back project. So we have a lot of different resources available for free on the on the website. Um, is it also possible to, to share the your work online uh, to 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 send um, to, to, to give us the, the opportunity to, to have your, your feedback on, the, on this uh, document. Uh, and of course, at the end, while you complete all the different uh, items, you will have your, your action plan based on your need. Because for example, if, you, if a city wants more to, to develop some uh, different policy, mostly focused on active schools, you can only fill in uh, the, the document um, on the active calls item, if you want to have some uh, feedback, uh, good experiences on uh, mobility, it's really up to you uh, to, to, to adapt uh, the, the use of this uh, document, uh, adapt to, to your need. Uh, so at the, at the bottom of my screen, you can see the, the link uh, to, this, uh, to this tool. Uh, so uh, our main goal with uh, our partner is to, to help city to, to get started this uh, journey toward an active uh, city. We, we really imagine it as simple as possible and as useful as possible for, for the municipality. So uh, I, I'm done with my presentation, but if you are interested or if you know any municipality stakeholder that can be, uh, please do not hesitate to, to share. Uh, and if you have any question, I will be more um, happy to, to answer them. My uh, email address are on the screen, so I will be happy to, to discuss it uh, with you if, uh, if you're interested in, the, in this uh, project. Thank you. Thank you, Clara, for presenting this great resource that is the Matrix for Change. Uh, the link has been posted in the chat. Please check it out, uh, as Clara said, as a starting point uh, towards uh, your path uh, to making an active city. Our last uh, speaker of today, of this session and of the day, uh, is Fozzi Egeran Moritz, uh, who will be presenting the guidelines for Active City Innovation. Fozzi, please, the floor is yours. Okay, here we go. Uh, and people who, who know me know that I would be much more happy to be with you. I don't like to talk in front of cameras, but I'll try my best to entertain you anyway, because it's so late in the day already. Uh, what I like to talk to you about, because we are the innovation guys, it's uh, what the perspective of innovation may hold for you, for the audience. And especially, I like to introduce the two approaches that we are currently pursuing also in cooperation with PAPISA, that is the Active City Innovation Workbook and the Job Movement Pioneers Innovation Hub. First of all, um, why active cities? This is the slide. I will not talk about this because the whole day is about it a little more about why innovation actually. And, and our argument in why active city innovation is that um, with, the, with building something new, you can best adapt to your own environments, to your social, cultural, geographic, whatever economic environment, you get what you want and what you need. You will have solutions that are not out of date, but in the, in the line of trend and zeitgeist. Um, I need to use that German word. You will have an opportunity to address unique needs and interests that have never been addressed before. It's very efficient and effective at the end because it's dedicated to your needs and it may also work for your city marketing. Um, how to do it, that is the, the general, the very much summary of our innovation methodology is 
first of all, you need to convince all the stakeholders that this is an important issue. And that is really what we have been working on most. <laughs> and still we need to, to, to get better at that. How to get all the stakeholders in the city behind this mission. And especially in Germany, this at times seems to be very difficult. Then you elaborate all the opportunities that you may have and determine the most suitable approach. And this really to, to ask the right questions and to get the right focus, this is what determines most of the efficiency at the end. And then you, you develop your solution and, and, and there's some guidance in that. And then you need guts and implementation. This is an important issue. This is a new issue and, and be brave in making new things happen. Why us? In that particular case, <laughs> we as an, an, an innovation company with very much uh, um, um, history of sport from the prevention to movement up to elite sport um, have been establishing the International Sports Innovation Network that was already about bringing health and happiness to the world uh, a number of years ago. And in that we had an active city innovation project. And in that again, we have been developing what I'm gonna be talking about today briefly, the active city innovation workbook. So this is the guidance I, I refer to for what Fiona has uh, said this morning, how to. So this is the how to guidance to make new approaches happen. And the Joy of Movement Pioneers Innovation Hub, that is message take home three from Fiona's um, presentation, strong partnerships. Um, the Active City Innovation Workbook um, is just in the in, in, in the process of being finished, we were in the final design stage. This is uh, for, for the stakeholders who like to embark on innovation it, 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 in, in, for active cities. Um, we, this will offer some guidance, some inspiration, some checklist, some way how to do it. So you will hopefully learn a lot, but also it's the starting point of some capacity building or some project that we may embark upon together. So it kind of serves in itself, but of course not with the workbook, you instantly are an innovator already, but we hope it's nevertheless gonna be inspiring. In that we have developed an artificial island. So as an innovation adventure island, as we call it, so that you can see how from the very much the, the, the commitment of creating an active city and using some innovation approaches until finally realizing and testing some of the uh, your, your innovate, innovative result all happens on that island. And also it happens with personae that represent the typical stakeholders of the, such a venture. So that hopefully you as active city innovators will then find your own role. And in those discussions and these courses it is probably easiest to see what arguments are there in the different stages of creating an active city innovation and how you could possibly deal with it and how what the value of cooperation of different types of stakeholders is. And it's also more entertaining. The pages look about like this, where you're on the top, you see the different, um, the different stages of in where you are, you have the dialogues, you have the reflections, you have pictures and also you have checklists, which not on, on that page now. So this is about the, um, just briefly introducing the, this thing, um, how to, and strengthening partnerships. Um, we also in, in great cooperation with Tapisa, uh, been establishing the Joy of Movement Pioneers Innovation Hub, a social network based innovation hub Briefly, the story also starts with the, with what we are addressing, what Fiona has been has been talking about this morning, the 500 million, six, 300 billion treatment cost. This is massive. And this hopefully will help strengthen our point also in our approach in, in, in public stage. Um, because we have seen that there are so many programs, initiatives, studies, whatever, and still with all of that, what is happening, um, the level of physical activity about uh, remains the same, and especially among adolescents, it's rather going down. So nowadays, it's not even 20% of them being sufficiently physically active. 
And so what, what we've what we found also through our network, through our project is we need to make a difference. We need to start something new. And what that is, is that we need to start with the, with the intrinsic motivation um, for people understand why they want to move. And the core, um, the core driver we find is joy. So understanding what is the joy of movement and then producing solutions that afford people that make them experience their joy of movement will make more people participate and participate in people being more intensive and longer active. There's preliminary studies showing that, but it's also common sense. Um, so that is what we are embarking on. Um, trying to put joy of movement at the at the center, at the point of origin for innovations in making people move more. And there we are com compiling inspirations, good practice. We also offer capacity building. Uh, we offer we highlight joy of movement pioneers, and also we try to advocate that idea that putting the emotions and the fun first in making people move more is so important, and this will open up in new dimensions. We think this, what we are doing is sort of unique because we combine joy competence, movement competence, innovation competence, and implementation competence in our core partner network. And I don't have much time uh, to, to, to introduce um, all the uniqueness. This is not, I'm, I'm not, not advocating for this. You just see the initiators, a couple of promoters, supporters, activators, and joy ambassadors exist. And that shows already how in such a network style, you can integrate different institutions and people into roles that fit to them in things that they do anyway. So this is a really, really efficient innovation network style. If this is interesting to you, we just had last week at the first inaugural invitation, please, please help us set this uh, or, or, or make this thing grow. Uh, what examples are there on the left? You can initiate projects in your respective environment and say, okay, let us do that. Let us start with joy of movement and go from there in innovations, uh, in, in, in innovation to make people more physically active. You can become a core supporter also or contribute with other research. We, will, we are very, very dedicated to bring joy and to bring health and happiness and to bring activity in that world into that world. Thank you so much and looking forward to questions. Thank you so much for the uh, for presenting this and really having this idea of innovation and joy at the center. And I think uh, this is one of the questions we will tackle later. But first and foremost, so we're having uh, 10 minutes for a question and answer session. Uh, please, if you have any question answers, uh, not answers, but questions, publish them in the Q&A box. And I will start with a question uh, that I've seen uh, already answered partially uh, by Lynn, uh, which was about harmonization and solidization of practices. But I want to get a broader perspective. Do you uh, happen to collaborate with other universities or other institutions, uh, maybe in Liverpool, in the country, or even abroad, uh, in your work uh, with Liverpool, for instance, but also in your work with other cities. And how do you go about uh, this partnership and how do you go about also harmonizing the different indicators and measurements? It's a tough question. So yeah, we, we work with lots of different universities on lots of different projects. And, and Jamie's a very connected university. There's lots of collaborations for lots of different projects. So not just related to physical activity, but across the university. Um, we, we work with the universities through academic research, really, and through developing collaborations that way. But we have worked and linked with colleges and universities in cities directly as a result of the Global Active City work. So, for example, colleagues in Friedrichstadt, colleagues in Buenos Aires, places like that, where we've, we've actively tried to work with the local institutions to try and help support the Global Active City certification process and, and help cities develop their strategies and infrastructure. So yeah, we do try and do that. In terms of physical activity measurement, we are involved in pro projects with data harmonization and there are, in research, there are some kind of 
best or gold standard measures that we all use and we all try to use similar harmonization techniques although in physical activity there is no one best method and there is no one agreed way of doing things so actually a big focus of research at the moment is harmonization and is working on harmonized data it's really complex and actually in physical activity it's it's a lot to do with the technology and how technology has improved as well but for Active City, when we were initially talking about the ISO, stand, ISO compatible standards, we did talk about this a lot, about whether something should be standardized. We have should have something standardized in, in, the, in the standard around measurement. But it's just a bit too difficult to do that. It's too um, it's quite restrictive to cities that might not quite be at that point yet to, to enforce a, a, a specific measure. But there are measures that I would recommend, that the team would recommend, that are very um, easy to harmonise across different countries, settings, uh, cities, rural, wherever, um, whereas others are a little bit more specific. It's something that I'd really welcome um, a discussion on with the cities, with institutions that are involved in Global Active City. It's something we're really interested in doing. So. If anyone's interested, just, just get in touch and we can talk about it. Thank you. And I think your call was heard loud and clear. We need cooperation. So please reach out uh, to Lynn and see how you can work together uh, on this. Uh, I think it's a brilliant uh, idea. Uh, I have a question now for Clara regarding uh, the matrix. You, you've highlighted a little bit how the matrix can be used and uh, how it can be a powerful tool. Could you just describe in a few words uh, if an individual in a city wants to bring about some change? So what would be a bit their journey in using the matrix and how can they use the matrix in their uh, municipality to make a change? What would the expected outcome be uh, for you uh, when an individual uh, is using the matrix and is trying to implement change? Yes, thank you, thank you, Gaetan. Thank you for this uh, for this question. So, yeah, as I mentioned, this um, this matrix, this online tool, is really user friendly and super uh, easy to to use online, super uh, interactive. So, and it allows uh, municipalities, so yeah, an individual, a stakeholder who want like to to develop some policy uh, within the city to to assess them, themselves against proven and successful elements of uh, of action. Uh, yeah, by identify which elements are uh, relevant, and then to, to to be able to to build a, an action plan. So regarding or on the need, uh, if a city identify a specific uh, need, they will fill in this uh, this document, and at the end, based based on the large uh, studies uh, we we develop during the the first packed project, we're gonna uh, provide uh, them with uh, a lot of different good practices and concrete elements that, that the main um, uh, important thing about th this matrix is like that it can provide really concrete elements, good practices that are already been implemented in another city. So you can compare your, your city to, to, one, to, to another uh, and to implement a yeah, concrete action, concrete policy uh, on the, at the local uh, territory to, to to develop so, some strategies, some policies, some initiatives, uh, some easy ones, some more um, uh, elaborative one to, to, to build up the city and to, to help citizens on at the local level to, to be more uh, to be more active. Thank you, Clara. I think it's a, it's a powerful tool that's uh, very comprehensive, tackling from policy to good practices, and can also help, uh, I guess, inspire uh, policymakers and digital makers uh, in implementing change. Uh, I have a question now for Fotsi. Uh, there's one thing that's really striking in the presentation you just made, and you briefly touched upon it, is really uh, the approach of having innovation, but also joy as really the focus and the center of your concept. Could you maybe explain a little bit more about uh, this philosophy behind uh, using joy and how you go about making joy the end goal or uh, one of the key focus areas to uh, implement change? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, Gaetan. Um, th that was really in our uh, in the work in the project of our network. We found that it is so decisive on the one hand to to 
make joy uh, of movement the origin and uh, of, of innovation physical activity but to do that um, to understand what joy of movement is um, also with different in different cultures and with different joy types so we started to develop like a huge um, picture system overview of all the of all the things that make up for the for the uh, for joy of movement and we understood that there's even the the area or the the stage of anticipation so you do something looking forward to what we in german call vorfreude looking forward to something that that motivates you to to embark on some activity then what is most efficient and often least addressed is the immersive moment so that is the flow moment that is the, the fulfillment of curiosity that is the, the moment of mastering technologies. That is a moment of experiencing humor, of experiencing social bonding, self-efficacy. So we have loads and loads of factors. And it's like a huge checklist to say, OK, these things, if we address them, then we go directly to the immersion of people to, to move more. And then we have the, what is called the introjective. So the, the, you like the results so that you are more, more, more healthy, more active, more beautiful, more attractive, more agile, more whatever. This is this is also a sort of motivation. But the most important one is how do you create the moments of immersion? Because this this then will make you want to go all over and over again because you just like to to be immersed in what you are doing. And we learn a lot also from from people, in, for example, only who, who, who design games uh, and see how do they make people immerse and get attracted. And so how can we trans transfer this to, to innovations in, in um, joy of movement? And much more, I could talk for ages, but I hope this gives a little bit of the idea of, of what, how we go about this. Thank you for the, it's such a universal and relatable emotion, I think, to really be in the flow, to be immersed like this. And I think that can really uh, touch a lot of people. So it makes sense that you have this embedded in your approach. Maybe we have uh, one last question uh, for Lynn. I had a question uh, about the maintenance and the legacy of the work you're doing with monitoring and evaluation. Uh, university, I think, uh, of Liverpool John Lewis University, for example, in your case, uh, cannot evaluate and monitor every single project, every single approach that is done at the, at the level of your city. And so you mentioned that you're also doing some training. But when we talk about monitoring and evaluation, it is such a key component of uh, what makes a successful strategy really successful. And yet we sometimes find some reluctance uh, from uh, the people who are practitioners or who are implementing programs to really do the work uh, to ensure that monitoring and evaluation is properly carried out. So how do you go about uh, identifying the people you can train at different levels and uh, bringing them on board uh, to make sure that this mindset of monitoring and evaluating everything you do, every project, every approach and concept can really become a part of uh, all of the activities and initiatives that are implemented? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question and it's a really difficult um it's a really difficult one so we've got we've evolved quite a long way we've come a long way in liverpool i think from where we started so when we when we first started work on active city many many programs weren't evaluated um but what we've done over the years is develop standard evaluation frameworks that projects can use themselves that can be very light touch so measure just things like participation number of people through the door those types of things and they can range in their complexity and their detail but other other things are linked to funding so if you're a municipality funding uh projects part of the funding requirement is that you report back so it becomes linked to the funding that, that you have to do some form of evaluation it doesn't have to be really in-depth research grade you know really detailed it can be very light touch but it's it's good practice so we need to be promoting good practice um yeah in terms of the university's uh, engagement in in evaluation we evaluate the programs that we would run through research programs that's that's obviously part of the research process 
we work together with the council and with our partners if they have key strategically important projects and they need a little bit more detail that's when we'll come on board there'll be some sort of joint funding or there'll be some sort of agreement between the two parties and and that will be then more rigorous and more in depth so it's really on a case by case basis but if it is linked to funding if there is funding that's been bid for there should be something in the specification, something in the tender process, in the bidding process that requires some element, element of reporting of key performance indicators. And as I say, that could be very small scale, very simple. But if it's a large amount of money, you could argue it needs to be a bit more uh, robust because we need to demonstrate value for money. This is public money in the main. So we need to demonstrate that this is a good use of public funding and it's making a difference. So that's how we've tackled it on other projects. So, for example, we've been involved in the work, workplace accreditation uh, system recently, the WAC project with, with Michael. And in there, we've talked about, you know, evaluation, about monitoring types of things there. So it is starting to, uh, I guess, find its way into most things. Um, but, but there will be still a lot of projects locally and nationally that aren't evaluated, but would benefit from some form of light touch evidence gathering just to help understand what's happening, if it's worth uh, the money, if it's providing value for money, if it's helping the people it's supposed to help, if it's recruiting the people it's supposed to recruit. And that can be very, very light touch or it can be in a lot more detail. So we're kind of there to try and help support that process. Thank you so much. And indeed, uh, I guess it's not an easy task, but uh, it's great that you have some insights on how uh, we can try to step by step change the mindset of people. Uh, I just saw we had one last question, but I think we are running out of time. So if you could please check uh, the question in the Q&A box, uh, Lynn, and uh, maybe even share if you have resources uh, from LGMU or that you're aware of. Uh, on how uh, we can work with this intersectoral cooperative action, uh, such as you have experience with uh, in Liverpool. Thank you to all of the speakers of this session, and thank you to all of the attendees uh, for staying with us so far and for engaging uh, with our speakers with questions and answers. And now I'm happy uh, to pass the floor again to Michael Gross from Evaleo and the Active Wellbeing Initiative. Thank you very much, Gaetan. And uh, it was a great fourth session today with a lot of so interesting information, but also challenges. And as you've said, uh, Gaetan uh, and Lynn, uh, perhaps we can dream. And I hope that in the future, we will be able to build new uh, funded projects to work on the topic of monitoring and measurement in the field of active cities. And uh, not only speaking about municipalities, but as um, as a collaborative projects, including stakeholders at different levels, local levels, regional levels. So we will work on that together and I'm sure we will find some options to, to work on that. So now, um, before the end of the, um, the meeting today, I will just share some information about um, the pathway uh, that includes um, the joining of the Active Wellbeing Initiative and, uh, in a second time, the, the Global Active City Certification. Uh, okay, so here uh, you will find my contact. Uh, I saw some messages during the day that's asking for for meetings after after the, the event today. So uh, you will receive, as you've said, Gaetan, uh, in one in, in the coming days, all the, the presentation. Um, so I'm representing the Active Wellbeing Initiative uh, as a collaborative uh, platform. And, uh, and the Active Wellbeing Initiative is also uh, managing the operation related to the Global Active City Pathway. Uh, in relations and partnership with uh, the, the partners of today. Um, so just some words about the Global Active City. Perhaps you understood that starting 2015, 2016, um, Tafiza, Evaleo, but also uh, the, the Liverpool Active City, the City Council and the Liverpool John Moores University with the great support of the IOC, uh, we were able to develop the, the Global Active City Scheme uh, and Certification, which is an international standard, a certification scheme, recognition scheme, and an education and empowerment program for, for cities. I think for me, 
most important message that we had today uh, is that uh, uh, it's not a recipe from A to Z to follow, to be able to make more people move, more people uh, active uh, in, in the different uh, cities or, or, or regions of the world. So it means that the targeted and personalized approach, that's probably part of the, of the solution. Uh, that's also the case when we speak about the Active Wellbeing Initiative and the Global Active City, means that um, it has to be considered as a framework with different areas to, to understand and to, to take as uh, ingredients. But at the end of the day, every city, every municipality will develop his own global active city approach or his own active city approach. Of course, uh, there's the benefit um, of the network and that's more or less the purpose of the webinar today uh, to give opportunities to different types of uh, contributors, partners, cities, uh, representative of government and so on and so forth to connect and to share together, to learn from the other. Uh, so that's more or less um, one of the most benefits we expect from the, the global active city. So to benefit from tools, uh, develop on the basis of experiences. So today I can mention uh, the great examples we had speaking about the packed metrics that of course can be used for a person, a representative of a city, representative of an interested organization as a starting point to learn about this topic of active city. Um, so manage with the tool online to have some more insights on the topic and try to start something locally uh, and start to develop an, an active city pathway. That's one example, but of course we have many others. I can mention also the, um, uh, the, the capacity building workshops that can be proposed by either Tafisa or Liverpool John Moore University, Evaleo, or in a collaboration together. So in the past we had, of course, different type of workshops that uh, can be proposed to support municipalities uh, that want to start somewhere. Um, and I can also uh, mention the e-impact a program that is on, under development that has been developed by, by Evaleo and that uh, can also support municipalities to, to start somewhere. Um, and of course, to try to have the opportunity to um, facilitate the discussion between cities. Uh, that's very important and that's more or less what we were able to do today. Um, so to start, uh, the pathway uh, of certification, it's five key steps. Um, the first one is a letter of intent. So we designed the program to be uh, very accessible. Um, so the idea with the letter of intent is to make sure that someone representing a municipality could be a city department, could be an agency, could be someone, the city council, um, uh, put uh, on a document the, the motivation, the intention to start an active city uh, approach uh, and sharing some information about the context uh, of this um, uh, of this project within the, the city. So based on the letter of intent, the pathway is starting. So the city is joining the active well-being initiative. Uh, and of course, throughout the pathway, uh, we can propose different type of tools. The first one is a, a discovery questionnaire uh, about active city. Uh, so this questionnaire helps the, um, the global active city team and partners uh, to understand a bit more about the specific context of the municipality of the city. And it's a way to start discussion, more deep discussions about what could be the, the next steps and what could be the, the challenges and the potential solutions to move forward. Again, the city is developing its own global active city approach. And after a few months uh, of de development, uh, we can organize a global active city initial diagnostic uh, which is online half a day and um, the city can benefit from a report status 
related to the existing framework and the, the, the global active city certification requirements. So at this stage, the city can benefit from the active well-being initi initiative partner city label uh, to use as part of the communication uh, of the municipality. And at this stage, um, the representative of the city have a, a much better understanding of the key areas and the components of the global active city. Uh, and they have the choice to decide to move forward uh, in a more formal commitment to the certification. Of course, it's not an obligation. So it means that the city can take part of the active well-being initiative network for one, two, three, four years. But uh, if the city want to benefit more, uh, from, the, from the global active city recognition, uh, it must have to be a, a commitment to the certification. And here starts the certification evaluation process that is more or less based, based on two steps. So a stage one audit, uh, which is also uh, online, and a stage two audit, which is called the, the certification audit that is organized on the ground, two days, three days visits by uh, some experts from the global active city and uh, speaking with the, uh, the authorities of the city, with the project managers, with different types of uh, partners that are contributing to the Alliance. And after the certification audit, uh, if the city is considered as, as uh, ready for the certification, um, the city can be certified. And here starts, the four years of the validity of the cert of the certificate, and there's every year uh, a progress statement, a monitoring and impact measurement statement, and uh, organized around follow up audits. Um, and I will uh, finalize my presentation by explaining that one of the most important thing is that. The, the active city pathway has to be built on what already exists because it's never starting from scratch. There's in every city is always uh, sports clubs, education uh, organization, and a lot of programs running. Uh, and that have to be considered as a starting point to build an active city approach. And here, I just want to use uh, the opportunity I have to, to speak today uh, to say congratulations to the new cities that has been certified in 2022 as global active cities. So it's the city of Fredrikstad in Norway. Here we can see the, the mayor of the municipality uh, and uh, the, the manager of the Active Lives Agency. And it was the case also for the city of Graz in Austria uh, that has been awarded in 2022 as a global active city. And here you can see the picture of uh, Thomas, the, the Global Active City Lead Officer, the Mayor of the Municipality, and, and a Councillor of the Municipality. Uh, so congratulations to them. And um, that's more or less the end of my short presentation about the process. Of course, don't hesitate to contact me after the meeting. And again, I really want to thank all the, the partners involved over the years. Uh, with a great journey around uh, promoting physical activity and well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Michael. For the last formal 10 minutes, I'm just going to ask for a few reflections from the uh, from the organisational team. So, Gaetan, I'm going to come to you, followed by Alistair, and then uh, John's going to represent LJMU. So I'll pass the floor over to you for a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you, Keith. And uh, for Tafiza, I will actually ask uh, our Secretary General, uh, Jean-François Laurent, uh, to share his insights and takeaways from the workshop. Jean-François, please take it away. My apologies. <laughs> no worries at all. Thanks a lot, uh, Keith. Thanks, Gaëtan. Thank you, everybody, of course, for joining us today. Uh, I think there are quite some takeaways the, that we can take over from, from today's. I remember very well the very first presentation made by uh, Dr. Fiona Bull from the WHO with some very interesting data as per the costs of physical inactivity across the world and the rampaging 
uh, challenges that this poses to our societies. And I would strongly believe that this data, this piece of work which WHO has put together, together with the UNESCO Fit for Life framework, will provide our movement, will provide municipalities, will provide all of us with very strong argumentation as to why should one invest in sport for why should one one invest in physical activity participation and and what uh, we can get in return so this is really something that will stay with me out of this day and of course uh, what we heard uh, following this uh, in, we had case studies in the field of active spaces in active schools active workplace of active mobility we heard of uh, how some municipalities are putting together their own active cities program but also how a country like ireland can uh, create a program for an, uh, various communities and, and various cities across the board. And this is something I think which I think which is very important and which should really take away as well. Active cities is not a program, a product or something which is only for cities. It is a movement, it is an approach which should be taken hands on and very seriously also by national organizations and decision makers because municipalities are the main local government areas. They are the areas which are the closest to the people and the main decision making body which can make a difference at the grassroots and uh, those local government areas, those municipalities will need support from uh, the national level as well. And finally, what I will take out of today will be the various resources which are existing and which show that any city around Europe, any city around the world can, uh, whatever its current level of engagement, physical activity and sport for all, it can find help, whether it is at a very basic level, whether it is at an advanced level, we heard about the pack matrix, we heard about active city innovation, we heard as well about global active city, but there is something out there and there is a full team which is ready Futafisa, LJMU, Evaleo, Innovations Manufacture, or Sported Citizenship. There is a full team behind there ready to help you. And uh, I would like to say this is a very positive uh, fact. Uh, and very, we very much look forward to continuing working with you following this conference. So thank you, everybody, for uh, joining from my, from my side. Thank you, LJMU, for hosting this conference. And once again, congratulations on your bicentenary. And uh, thank you, Evaleo, for the partnership. We very much look forward to your context. Okay, and thank you for that, Jean-Francois. It's always great to hear your insights. And I'll, I'll ask Alistair to uh, to make a couple of comments from Evaleo. Thanks, Alistair. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. Um, yeah, it, what an interesting day. Uh, I all, honestly overwhelmed with information, with uh, uh, ideas, with good practices, with uh, starting points, with so much, so much. It was uh, very, very interesting. Um, I take away two or three things. Uh, first of all, um, very much agree with Jean Francois, and of course, going back to Fiona Bull's uh, comments. Um, yes, we need national, international framework, but the city seems to be, the city or the urban space seems to be uh, a, a focal point, which is halfway between policy uh, and the person. So let's not forget that we're not talking about cities. We're talking about how cities can help citizens, how active schools can help school children or the school child, how active workplaces can help the employee to be better, to have uh, better long-term sustainable health and well-being. So uh, let's keep the person at the center of all this. Um, we heard a lot of uh, interesting cases, uh, case studies. We didn't hear anybody who sort of uh, said, okay, uh, Here's a case study, where do I begin? It came through in the chat, of course, but uh, most of the speakers have, have, have been relating how they started and how they move forward. Uh, one thing that I do remember from one of the uh, audits that we did in the uh, Global Active Cities is uh, a city who just said, uh, a little is better than nothing at all.
Sure, we've been talking about investment, we've been talking about whatever, but don't forget that it starts with a first step. A little is better than nothing at all. Um, from the different cases we've heard, uh, very, very obvious that each city or each urban uh, area is a specific case in its own. Uh, Mary Corey said, uh, give us perfect illustration that with the five key cities in Ireland under their uh, Sports Ireland project, uh, they have got not different agendas because they've all got one agenda, but they have uh, different ways of getting there. They're different starting points and they've got uh, different objectives depending on uh, all sorts of local conditions. So uh, there's no recipe for the whole thing. Uh, but the one word, if I had to sum everything up, the one word I've heard so often today is oh, in different synonyms, alliance, networking, partnerships, collaborative approach, uh, you name it. Uh, but we must have that. All uh, Everybody has said, I think, that this is essential working together and so on behalf of Evalio I'm more than happy to say uh, I'm proud to be working with LJMU I'm proud to be working with Tafisa and I've been proud uh, on the outcome of today's uh, event thank you very much back to you Keith Thank you very much, Alistair. The feelings are mutual. We've we've had a long and positive relationship between all of our organisations. And I think alongside those phrases, uh, which are absolutely the right things, collaboration and joined up thinking, it's clearly about communication as well. Uh, and I think today was a great example of that. But I'll hand over to John for, for the last word from the university. Thanks, Keith. Um, many of you already know me. For those of you who don't, uh, my name is John Marsden. And I'm the International Active City Officer for Liverpool John Moores University. On behalf of the university, I would like to add our thanks to our speakers, our colleagues from Tafisa and Avalio, and of course, all of our participants. I'd also like to offer many thanks to Zoe for all of her great work around the chat and the q and I know that can't have been easy today and tried to keep all those plates spinning. Um, throughout the webinar, we have heard some great examples of the different components of an active city model, together with examples of existing active city approaches in different parts of the world. And I think collectively what we would like to do going forward is to build on those examples of good practice and that work. For everybody's information, a communication will be sent to all participants tomorrow, which will have my contact details on. And I will be delighted to receive any follow up questions you may have, and will be delighted to support your work going forward in conjunction with Tafisa and the Valio. I would now like to close the formal part of the webinar programme. However, just to mention that after a five minute break, representatives from the university, together with the Valio and Tafisa, will be available to answer any further questions you would like to ask now. These can be asked in the same way as we've been doing throughout the session um, through the through the Q&A. Um, so far, for those of you who don't have any further questions at the moment, I'd like to thank you again and to wish you goodbye. And for those that do have questions, I look forward to seeing you again in, in five minutes time. Thank you all. Thank you very much, John. Uh, so yes, uh, everybody gets a five minute break to go and have a cup of tea, coffee or uh, stretch their legs. Uh, and we'll be back on here in five minutes time. Thank you, everybody who's uh, given their time today. Much appreciated. <laughs>